to be clear about it because it's a citizen comments. It's not a dialogue. So there's not going to be back and whoops, sorry, back and forth between the folks making comment and then the, the board members will listen to your comments and go from there. And I know that there's a number of people here tonight and I'm just going to take them in the order that they've been submitted. So I'll call you to the front and you'll come to one of these microphones and have a seat and share with us your name, your address, and then the comments that you would like to present. And we will start with Chris Jacobs. And maybe just to keep, I don't want to say to keep things moving in not being a respectful way of that, but so that you guys know who's up next so that you're prepared. The next person would be Crystal Nelson. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Chris Jacobs. I'm at 513 Mustang Drive in Ogden. Um, I'm the executive director of the House Cafe in Ogden. We run the teen center in Ogden. I won't lie, uh, I don't totally want to be here, but I was reading Proverbs the other day and it said, open your mouth for the mute and for the rights of all who are destitute. Basically for the poor. Um, I'm gonna try and explain the last 10 years we've been working in Ogden as quickly as possible through three different kids. So it starts when they're younger, we start working with them. And in a lot of cases, they'll get locked out of their house because the parents don't want them in there. Um, we've had kids who have to fix their own food at three, four, five, six years old. They have to wake themselves up and get them to school. So we start working with them pretty young. As they get older, they get into high school. And the best way I can explain that is last week, one of our teens emailed his teacher and he said, I'm drowning and nobody's helping me. And for me, that kind of gave me this picture of sometimes how I see USD 383, which is it's a boat that's sailing. And every year for the last 10 years, there are kids, and I'm speaking specifically with poverty in Ogden, but there's kids who fall off the ship and they start drowning. And I feel like Jesus called us to jump into the water after them. So we're down there and we're trying to help them as best we can, but their home environment, the people they're around doesn't facilitate, uh, mentality for success in a lot of instances. And then the last example is I'll have teens who will call me at, and these are true stories, uh, 2 a.m. for a ride to the ER because they OD'd. Um, a group of teens were sitting around calling it Ogden Prophecy because they all have drug addiction and they couldn't get out of Ogden and they feel destined to fall back in there. So the reason I'm here is because uh, I understand it's a very difficult time we're in, but COVID is bringing out issues that already existed. And one of the issues that already existed is that the poorest in our community don't have the home life and the structure that others do. Now, on one hand, um, I'm a parent of two in the district. It's stressful, it's hard, but my kids are gonna be okay because I read to them. We do our assignments together. It's not easy, but my kids are gonna be okay. The kids that I work with who are not my biological children, I've seen it every year, they're not okay under normal circumstances. So my plea to the district is, we are in Ogden doing this work. We've been there for 10 years. When these kids come back, you're gonna see the gap because I can tell you there's a lot of kids who haven't touched anything since March. The packets were sent home, homework's being sent home but I'm telling you it's not getting done. And at the end of the day, when they come back, you are gonna see a gap between the haves and the have nots, and it's bad. And I'm telling you this from my perspective because I work with them every day. So my prayer is one, we start having the conversation about what to do with the gap when they get back. And it's also, we're there in Ogden, if you guys ever wanna reach out, so, yep. Thank you, Chris. Crystal, if you'll come forward. And after that is Melissa Rundus. My name is Crystal Nelson of 877 Nevely Drive. I have friends in both the Kansas City area as well as the Wichita area who have children going back to school with a traditional five days a week schedule. Their children are thriving, as are the children who attend other schools within the city five days a week. Yet I sit back and listen to my eight-year-old ask questions like, Mama, how come they can have sports practice five days a week? Is it because sports are more important? Can I leave to go to another school so I can go five days a week like my friends did? 
I love my teachers, but I really want to go to school five days a week, and I really miss my friends. Why don't the grown-ups know that when the boys play football, they are breathing all over each other? And again, are sports more important than us? The other day, I received message after message from my third grader asking to come home from school. <clears throat> when I sent her teacher a message to ask if my daughter was okay, her teacher pulled her aside to talk. Do you know what happened? My daughter immediately burst into tears. You see, later that day when we talked, I discovered it was because she missed her two of her best friends who transferred to other schools to go five days a week. And the other best friend she only gets to see from across the school playground. I am so thankful Carly has such amazing teachers that helped her through that, that day. Do you know what we as parents did though? We got that tight group of four sweet girls together that weekend. Why? Because we recognize that the social emotional risk to our children far outweighs the risk of COVID at this point. Do you understand the message you have sent is that our children are not worth the risk? That sports are more important than education? Don't get me wrong. I come from a huge sports family. While I absolutely agree sports and extracurricular activities play an important part in children's lives, so does education. Just as important as their mental and emotional health. Do you understand that if you analyze the number of deaths in the 5 through 14 age range, that would equate to 49 deaths, 30 of which are from um, February to September, that died from COVID. In that same age group, 122 kids died from the flu pneumonia in 2018. Do you grasp that mental health providers' caseloads regarding children have skyrocketed in the area? If we don't do something, there will be a greater epidemic in the area as a result of the decline in mental health. You have stripped away my power as a parent to weigh the risks and determine which is the greater risk for my child. So with that in mind, I'm going to tell you what we need. We need to trust you and we need to be prepared. Be transparent. You as a board have not been transparent, often leaving parents as well as teachers wondering what your true motives are or the next move is. Allow us a seat at the table. Change your focus from blaming teachers and parents to finding solutions. Again, this is not the fault of the teachers. You ask for solutions from parents, yet as parents, we aren't given the opportunity to have an actual dialogue with you. Instead, we are given our three minutes to speak, then sit back and listen to various topics, as well as do some of you make sarcastic remarks about involving parents. You didn't even have enough respect for those of, of us in attendance at the last meeting to move the hybrid topic up on the, the agenda, even after one of your own members requested you do so. So you want solutions? Involve both parents and teachers in dialogue. Not a dialogue where teachers or parents have to defend themselves to you, but a true dialogue where a team works together to create solutions. Because the truth is the solutions and answers don't lie within you, they lie within the teachers and the parents. Thank you, Crystal. Melissa? And after that is Wesley Zika. Hi, my name is Melissa Rundis. I live at 1939 Blue Stem Terrace here in Manhattan. Um, it's a little intimidating coming here tonight knowing that I'm about to advocate for a view that very few people support. Um, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you as a board and to hear us at every meeting. I I'd like to say I'm not a fan of hybrid. I get that it's not ideal but I think it's the best option we have to assure the safety and health of school staff, teachers, and all students. I've heard people use Rock Creek, Wamigo, and Riley County and other nearby schools as examples of successfully going five days a week. I don't think those are fair comparisons. They're rural schools, they're smaller schools, they don't have our community's COVID test numbers, and they don't have numerous college students in their schools and classrooms serving as paras, teachers' aides, and other positions in the school. Additionally, their class sizes are smaller than our average class size. I think it's more relevant to look at schools in our own community or schools in similarly situated college towns. In Lawrence, they're doing a full remote learning with the goal of switching to hybrid maybe later this month. In Topeka, public schools, they're currently in a hybrid similar to ours. Wichita is doing hybrid and remote. Hutchinson started out five person days a week, but could not contain the virus. So they switched to hybrid this month. Over 20 Kansas schools who started out in person have switched to hybrid in the last month. I think that's significant. It's, in, it's instable and it's more chaotic to go for two weeks at a time or three and then be home for two weeks. And then we get to go back and we're there for three weeks. Oops, we got to come home for another two weeks because there's no way we can maintain social distancing in our schools with an all children back in school five days a week. 
There's an excellent private school in our own community struggling with COVID. Their average class size is less than 15 students, while USD 383's average class size is more than 20. As of last week, four of the teachers at this private school in our own community had contracted COVID this school year. Students go to school and then they're quarantined in their home, back and forth, full of instability. If this small private school with no college students serving as paras or classroom teacher aides cannot protect their students and staff against COVID, what chance do we have with over 20 students in a class where social distancing is impossible? Our classrooms are already crowded, hence the need for a new elementary school. What if teachers, paras, and staff members quit or become ill with COVID? We don't have an abundance of substitute teachers. We already have a district-wide para shortage. What are we gonna do if we don't protect our staff? Most other government agencies in this community are not requiring their employees to work in an unsafe work environment. The city, the state of Kansas, and K-State, I, I guess I would just ask you to try to work on the hybrid more, to look at other places where hybrid's successful, talk to parents and teachers about what's working, and give it a chance a little bit longer before we scrap it and end up in all virtual again. Thank you. Thank you. Wesley, and then Andrea Olane is next after that. I'm Wesley, I live at 3954 High Plains Ranch, and mine might be slightly over three minutes, but I'll try to read as fast as I can. My name is Wesley Zika, I am a sophomore at MHS. I play volleyball and basketball. I have been really actively involved in student council for the past two years, and I am a straight A student. Never have I struggled with school or felt the need to advocate for myself and many other students who I know are having the same struggles, but here I am. Hybrid learning is not working for me. I began having multiple breakdowns every night and decided to talk to my mom about how much I am truly struggling socially, mentally, and emotionally from hybrid learning. I am in the middle of my JV volleyball season right now and should be starting basketball in November, but the amount of time I spend trying to teach myself new concepts because I only see my teachers once a week will only allow me to do that will not allow me to do that this winter. On average, I spend 10 hours a day looking up different ways to help me practice and understand my lessons because I don't get the information and learning I need from a computer screen. My current grades most definitely do not reflect the type of student I am or the amount of effort I put into my studies. While I know the teachers are doing their best to support learning and teaching in a new way, I often feel that we are given busy work but aren't actually taught the concept or lesson on our remote days. They are balancing remote students and students in class, and we are left in most classes to teach ourselves on our days at home. When I have a question about my work, I have to email and possibly wait hours for teachers to respond because they are teaching in class at that time. If I was in the classroom, I generally could have my questions answered quickly with verbal explanations, and then I could move on. Learning from home also min minimizes the opportunity to hear the other students' perspective on material from class, which closes off a whole other valuable side of learning. Although I am always one to set my expectations high for myself to master what I am being taught, I now struggle to find myself just doing something to get it done by a certain time or a certain date and not learning it. I put a lot of pressure on myself to try to understand everything while also turning them in on time, and that's when stress and late nights consume my life. While managing the medical side of the pandemic in, was vital in August, um, and given the relatively limited number of positive tests and in the light of no illness outbreak, while still holding sports and practices and games, we now need to give our students credit for responsibility, wearing masks, and following safety guidelines developed in our schools. We now must look at how students like myself, who are not only struggling academically, but socially and emotionally. We cannot overlook the mental health of students because I am one that has majorly been affected in this way, and I know I am not alone. I am fortunate that I have a parent that works from home and can support my learning, and that of my three siblings struggling to get through their lessons. There are peers of mine who have no one at home and are forced by circumstances to be the teacher for their younger siblings. Many students feel isolated and alone and see their failing grades as a reflection of who they are or rather than their circumstances. We have successfully proven we can manage guidelines within the school but are failing at meeting our students' educational and emotional needs. This must be our priority. I understand that I come to you with all my feelings about what's not working. I'm grateful for the opportunity to tell you that I need that I need and also offer solutions. For me, four to five days in school in person would be ideal. The opportunity to be taught multiple days a week by my teachers in a classroom with my peers with social interaction 
would begin to mend damage done both academically and socially through this hybrid model. In the event that we cannot be in school four to five days, I think it is imperative that teachers live stream or record lessons each day so that we can have exposure to learning every day. I am personally excelling in my two classes that provide videos and audio of the teacher teaching a lesson for the days I am not in the classroom. This solution also stimulates a classroom as best we can and helps develop a more solid understanding. We can no longer consider the medical risks over the mental health risk. That pendulum has swung and now we are at a crisis level with the mental, mental health of our school. It is my hope you hear my voice, the voice of a strong leader, athlete, and student, but also a student that is struggling. This is not just my voice, though. I speak for my second grade sister who crumbles up her papers and falls to the floor when she's frustrated by Zoom or my or lesson or my fifth grade brother who cries and says, I just can't sit in front of a computer screen for seven hours a day. I speak for many. That is why I'm here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Wesley. Andrea? And then Joshua Peterson would be after that. Hi, my name is Andrea Lean. My family and I live at 100 South Manhattan. We have two children, first and second graders this year. They attended Theodore Roosevelt last year and we wanted them to attend Theodore Roosevelt this year and every year to follow. Since their birth at Well Child Checks, our, pediatri our pediatrician asked us, does your child have a schedule do you limit their screen time? Last March, when in-school learning was suspended, we no longer could answer yes to those two questions. At that point, families did their best juggling online learning, daycare, and employment. We all understand that our children's ability to learn effectively would have to wait until we had a plan. Although I'm not a trained teacher, I understand the dynamic educators, a structured schedule, and attendance are necessary for children to learn effectively. From March until May, our skilled educators attempted to instill passion remotely. The schedule was being worked out on the fly and attendance was not possible. Dest despite parents, teachers, and staff's best efforts, the last couple of months of the year were understandably unproductive. At July enrollment, we were given a choice of in-person or remote learning. Yes, a choice. With autism, we again enrolled our children as TR teddy bears. On August 5th, while watching the school board meeting, we knew that hybrid model was going to be used. Our family made the difficult choice of pulling our children out of their school. We enrolled them at Manhattan Catholic School where they could attend full time in person with safety precautions. Unfortunately, as a hairstylist, working from home wasn't an option. We are lucky our two children were accepted at MCS prior to them reaching capacity. Even though our children are attending school full time, I see what's happening. As a hairstyle and a member of the community, I hear from a lot of people. I talk to teachers, I talk to students, I talk to parents, I talk to students' grandparents, and other interested members of this community. Our entire community pays taxes to educate our children. We are, after all, a community. Are the children of our community learning effectively? Do they have a schedule? Do they have limited screen time? Are their teachers rested or are they exhausted? Have we asked them? Our school district, the pride, if not the obligation of our community has lost how many students since last year? Those students and the families and my family, we had a choice. Some students and families do not have a choice. Those families are dependent on your choice tonight. Perfect example of Chad that was a first speaker tonight. That was very touching. Do we continue to use hybrid model where families, teacher, and students are stressed and the basics of effective learning are not being met? Or do we choose something else? Do we choose to allow our district students to fall behind neighboring full-time in-person districts in private schools? With the safety precautions, we have to give full-time in-learning in learning person a chance. Please make the right choice. Thank you. Thank you. Joshua, you're next. And then after that would be Aaron Fackler. Hi, my name is Joshua Peterson. I live on uh, 331 North 17th Street. I'm a uh, representing my Smith Scholarship House here today. And I would uh, just like to express my concern for the 
expansion of the elementary school into the uh, Eugene lot field or yeah and uh, I just want to say that we use the house uh, you use the field as a house for uh, just um, frisbee and or ultimate frisbee and for um, just other games and such and we would just appreciate to reconsider the uh, building uh, I, I think you're building a expansion onto it and then also would not allow us to be on the land um, for that so I just ask that you reconsider um, and maybe change something to that so we could continue to use that as I think it's a vital uh, resource to the community and to our house of 34 guys so that's all I really have thank you okay thank you Aaron Fackler is next and then after that is Ashley Eckleberry. Hi, my name is Erin Fackler of 1837 Plymouth Road, Manhattan, Kansas. I currently have two kiddos who are enrolled in Amanda Arnold, Go Pandas. My family moved to Manhattan two and a half years ago. When we began our house hunting, everyone I spoke with had so many positive things to say about USD 383 and told me it was the way to go. Today, sitting in front of you, I want to keep believing that I made the very best decision two and a half years ago by putting my faith in a school district that people touted as the best. That being said, I firmly believe that some things need to change. So instead of sitting in front of you and asking for all the things I want, along with so many other parents, I'm going to tell you the things that we need. A short list of must-haves goes a lot further than a long list of that would be nices. Obviously, I could shoot for the moon and just tell you that we need our kids back in school five days a week in a classroom in front of the fantastic teachers that this district staffs, but I'm also realistic enough to know that there is likely already a plan in place that no one knows about yet. First, we need the ability to prepare. We need to be able to prepare for the next nine weeks. While I understand your response to that might be, we don't even know. But what you do have that we don't is an idea of what is about to happen and the power to wait until the last minute to loop us into that decision. The last minute decisions and notifications are the most difficult for parents, teachers, and students to handle. <clears throat> for students that have heard they're in hybrid through this nine weeks, they have countdown calendars in their brain and they need to be able to mentally prepare for what another nine weeks of hybrid will look like for them. For parents, whether working from home, out of the home or not at all, they need the ability to prepare for another nine weeks and make the appropriate accommodations for their children as learners and prepare a more long-term plan that they were once told was only temporary. For teachers who are working around the clock to provide their very best, they should be able to prepare for what another nine weeks of hybrid means for their classrooms, students, and families. Second, we need the ability to trust you. We need to trust that you are using all data available for the impacts of COVID-19, remote learning, tech-only education at the local level, regional level, and national level. Much of the information presented at the last meeting was presented without supporting qualitative data and merely accepted because it was said out loud. I hope as adults, we all know better than to just believe something because it was said out loud. We need to trust that you will not just listen to one set of information and treat it as the end all of information. And with that gathering of information, we need to trust that you will move forward as you have planned. We were given a reopening plan that contained <clears throat> a whole list of numbers and guidelines that needed to be met in order to reopen, along with the statistics and positivity rates that would throw us into a full remote situation. On bated breath, we monitored those <clears throat> numbers like I've only seen my father watch his NASDAQ reel. However, when we saw those big numbers, USD 383 didn't close their doors. They modified. Our fear is this constant modification to the plan we were given. What if numbers get low enough that according to the plan we could go back? Can we trust you that our children will be back in school or will you modify at that time in order to better suit the needs of someone other than the students of this district? Even more important than being able to trust the plan we were given, we need to be able to trust that you wholeheartedly have our children's academic, mental health, and overall well-being in mind. Because truth be told, right now it doesn't feel like that. Lastly, we need a seat at the table. There has to be a place where we can come together to communicate with a back and forth dialogue. There are so many opportunities for this. Maybe it's a round table, maybe it's a Q&A panel, but sending out a 
survey that we may or may not ever know the results of, being allowed to speak for three minutes and quickly turning to talks of construction and sports does not provide a space for parents to truly be heard or questions to be answered. We are, we as a collective are really great people who are actively trying to help and want to help with the solutions that provide the best for our children. I've heard from countless administrators and staff that USD 383 doesn't possess the resources to support a full in-person model, but have yet to hear what those needs are. As a group of parents and the entire fabulous Manhattan community, we want to help, but without a seat at the table to know the needs, ask the questions, and have our concern concerns truly be heard, you render us as unable to help. At this time, we need our kids back in school five days a week, but if that need can't be met, we need to be able to prepare. We need to be able to trust you, and we need a place for our voices to truly be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley? Hi. And then after that is, I think it's Katie Kadzi. Hi, my name is Ashley Eckleberry from 4050 Franklin Drive, St. George, Kansas. To the Board of Education and other interested parties. Good evening. My name is Ashley Eckleberry. I'm not one to normally brag on myself, but I think you need the context of what I will share. I've been a teacher in the district for going on 13 years. I've taught first grade and currently teach special education. I've worked every summer in a district summer camp and I'm currently the director of the Flint Hill Summer Fun Camp. I've been the lead tech for my school for almost 10 years. I'm on my SIT team as well as my building leadership team. Lastly, I am your current elementary teacher of the year. I say all that to let you know that I am one who will try, collaborate, and problem solve until I've exhausted all possible avenues. A few weeks ago, Katrina said something to the extent of wishing she could hear from more remote teachers, so here I am. While some of our experiences have been shared, I would hate for you to get the picture that our current situation is working for everyone. Remote is hard. It's hard for students, it's hard for families, it's hard for staff, and I am struggling. Teaching online is not as similar to teaching in person as people would like you to believe. Yes, we've been given some Canvas training, but that is just a platform. It does not prepare you to take your curriculum and make it available through this platform. We were not prepared for teaching kinders and others to write through a screen. We were not prepared to engage students while they are at their own homes with all of their belongings around them. We are not prepared to seemingly do this on our own. I've heard the reference of teachers flying the plane while we're building it, but that is not what it feels like. I am in a boat that is taking on water. I can see all the weak areas. I've been given tools, but I cannot get these tools to fix these problems. So instead, I'm scooping water out as quickly as I can to keep my students afloat until they can be rescued or we make it to the end of the year. I'm afraid we will reach our destination and while my students will have survived, you're going to have a lot of teachers that did not. We will go down with the boats just to save the kids. I can only push myself so far, stay up so late, work so many hours, put off other responsibilities and cry so many tears. I'm running out of everything. We are functioning with a population the size of two large elementary schools, yet our staff does not match that. We don't have enough MTSS support. We don't have enough at-risk aids. And our class sizes are high in many areas. Yes, having 30 kids in a physical classroom is problematic. Try having them in an online classroom. You can't see all of them at one time. They all have access to different materials, different support, and different stimuli. Some grades are working together to plan smarter, not harder. That is not the case for all grades. Many of our teachers are giving more than they possibly can or should. Normally, I would come to you with solutions to the problems I complain about. There is no fix for this that will make everyone happy. I know you're getting pressure from all sides. Not all teachers will be happy, not all parents will be happy, but we need you to make a decision. Make a plan and stick with it. I believe in this district. I believe in our goals. I believe in our mission, but I'm deeply disappointed with the wishy-washy moves that have been made. You've made criteria and then hesitated. You've made an agenda and then wanted to modify it. We cannot stand behind you when you keep moving, so please pick a path, plan for how to travel that path, and think ahead of what will be needed and how it will play out, and please do not forget your remote learning population. I'll end on this. Thank you to the board members who are talking to staff, showing up to individual school meetings, and having the backs of everyone involved, even when it means there are going to be disagreements. You are seen. You are appreciated. But the struggle is real. Is it Katie? Okay. Sorry, right up here. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. And after that is Tinda, sorry, Tim Lindmuth. Um, 
Hi everybody, my name is Katie Kaze. I live on 1728 Fairview Avenue. So this is the first time I'm here and I'm, yeah, okay, yeah. And I now see that I'm completely unprepared because people really wrote what they were going to say because I just learned about this meeting today and also um, one of the information by, because of which I came here, which is about related to this park behind the Eugene Field uh, School. So I learned that um, the plan is to um, remove the park or maybe reduce it and also make it more property to the school. So I will tell you a little bit. So I live in this neighborhood, neighborhood for about four and a half years only, but I can tell you that I really enjoy living there. It's very cozy, very charming neighborhood, very friendly. And I will say that this park is really big asset for the whole neighborhood, not only for my family, but for everybody who lives there. I have three kids. First, gra first grader, first grader, and two and a half years old, almost three. And we go to this park very often. And having the park nearby is really, really big advantage for us. And I believe that this is also very important for health, physical and men mental health for the kids, to be able to take them out without driving them somewhere and enjoy the nature. It's really cozy park. It allows you to play like soccer or frisbee or any such long distance game as well as has swings, has sand, so smaller kids also can enjoy. So I think this is going to be really, <clears throat> uh, I believe really big, big mistake to remove this part from here. And I also don't find it to be justified to do that because to, to extend the school, because I understand, I fully value the, the meaning of the school and education, but to take something away from the kids with the, with the reasons that you are going to give something again back to kids as such as bigger school, school, I don't find this is a good justification. In addition to that, I also wanted to mention that, as I said, this neighborhood is very nice, very cozy, and putting such a big parking lot in the middle of the neighborhood is going to significantly harm the neighborhood itself as a historical part of the town. As you know, this is one of the oldest parts of the town. And so it significantly is going to reduce the prices of the costs of the houses, which are around the, around this park. And I, I believe that this is not very nice towards the people who already decided to leave this in this area without having this huge parking lot in the middle. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Tim, Tim Lindmuth is next, and then Chloe, I think, Beeman after that. Yeah, good, good evening. Uh, I'm Tim Lindemuth. I live at 500 Denison Avenue, and I'm the president of the Eugene Field Neighborhood Association. And I know some of my other neighbors are here tonight to uh, also speak to you. Um, uh, I'm here to talk about the plans to renovate the Eugene Field School uh, as a daycare center and, and uh, uh, early childhood uh, education. Um, and how many of you were uh, serving on the Board of Education in June of 2009? Please raise your hand, 2009. You were, anybody else? Well, it seems, thank you uh, for your service because it seems like there is um, a lack of knowledge of history. And I would like these, this is the Manhattan City Commission uh, agenda for June of 2009. And I would like this entered into your uh, records tonight because they are pertinent to my comments. Uh, Jason Hilgers, the city, assistant city manager, provided this to me. And on that night, uh, the city commission approved a grant uh, application of three neighborhood associations. And they are the Eugene Field neighborhood, the Humboldt West neighborhood, and the uh, landmark uh, Water Tower neighborhood. And together, we submitted a neighborhood uh, grant proposal to have a playground, a neighborhood playground installed at the Eugene Field uh, uh, site. Uh, mainly because the playgrounds that were there uh, which had been available to neighborhood use were no longer, uh, um, they were closed to the neighborhood. And so um, the, the Board of Education approved uh, this move, the city 
uh, approved the grant monies and, and the playground was installed. Um, a, few, a few months ago, um, uh, Mary Lou uh, Marino, another neighbor whose property is, uh, borders the Eugene Field uh, property, uh, has been in contact with one of your city employees, uh, Tricia Brooke Afrund. Uh, and she is uh, working with the construction uh, 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 people that are designing uh, the expansion uh, of the Eugene Field School. And so we've been in, uh, communicating with her and she was not aware of this. So we provided this document from the city uh, to her. And, um, and so um, the Eugene Field neighborhood uh, is the last owner occupied neighborhood contiguous to the K-State campus. Uh, there are approximately 75 owner occupied homes that are there, and many of these have ch school children uh, uh, in, in, this, uh, in the district. And uh, many are faculty and staff that live there and like to work, like to walk to work. And so um, we're, a, we're a very uh, active neighborhood association. And we are asking you to please keep our playground. You already met, you already heard uh, some gentlemen from Smith House tonight uh, who talked about about their concerns, um, but this is this this was a lot of uh, neighborhood associations, a lot of people that went together to get this and that use it. And I know there are neighbors here tonight that use this, and they're going to be speaking to you about that. Um, so, um, please consider this. Uh, we would uh, we would like to be involved in the uh, the drafting of this. Usually. Uh, <laughs> uh, neighbors are involved with things that are going to affect them in their neighborhood. We have not been involved in any of this. We would like to be involved. So please uh, remember us as this goes forward. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here's, here's, uh, here's two of them. Thank you. Chloe, is it Beeman? And then the last one I have is uh, Jean Ann Linder after that. And if you'll come just right there. Yes. Um, I, I spoke with Tim about um, talking about this issue of the Head Start. Um, my name is Chloe Beeman. Um, I, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Chloe Beeman and um, I work in food service. Um, I, right now I live in the Eugene Field neighborhood. Um, I attended, excuse me, I attended Eugene Field for six years um, when I was a child. Um, sorry, this mask is really warm. <laughs> um, it, the Eugene Field School has operated um, for decades with about 200 children um, in the seven classrooms. So um, I know that when I went there, there was, I think there was around 200 people that were in the seven classrooms. Um, I just wanted to comment on the field where the structure has been proposed to be built. Um, currently, it is used by many students um, in the college and the frats, as well as adults and children that live in the neighborhood. Um, and also, I know that uh, when I was in kindergarten, I went to Northview Kindergarten, and we spent many hours in a, in a field playing as well, waiting for the bus. Um, outdoor green spaces promote health and activities for children and students, as well as team sports and recreation, and access to a healthy outdoor environment. Um, so I just wanted to stress the importance of um, before taking out a green field like this, the value that they add to the community. Thank you. Thank you. And the last form that I have is for Jean Ann Linder. Mrs. Linder, thank you. Well, my name is Jean Ann Linder, and I'm speaking tonight for my husband, Robert, as well as myself. <clears throat> my family has lived at 321 North 17th Street for the last 43 years. Two of my children attended Eugene Field. Our property abuts the upper playground of the school. We were very distraught when the school board closed our neighborhood school 
a few years ago. Families with children helped to solidify the neighborhood. The subsequent making of Eugene Field into a Head Start facility did not bring families into the neighborhood. The new proposal to double the size of the Head Start school, taking the upper playground field for a building site and parking lot will further make the area less desirable for families with school children. Green space is at a premium in this area. A small neighborhood play area was established through a grant for the upper playground. Area neighbors use this area all the time. My taxes pay to support the schools uh, of this city, but I am not pleased with the current proposal. I would like to see the school board act responsibly to the residents of the Eugene Field neighborhood. Please keep as much of the green field as is there now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any other forms for public comment. Okay, thank you for coming tonight. For item 6.0, we have the consent agenda, which contains the minutes from September 16th and 23rd, the consideration of bills, the human resources report, the donations and grants, which I will read at this point. There's a $25,000 cash grant from Daniel Keating Foundation to Manhattan High School to complete the construction of the Compassion Courtyard and support programs that align with district goals of having a responsive culture and supporting social and emotional wellness. A $4,025 cash donation from DCCCA Inc. to Manhattan High School for SAD Club Safe Activities. A $500 cash donation from the Manhattan Kiwanis Club to Manhattan High School to pay Kiwanis Key Club international dues for students. A $1,600 cash donation of, of classroom supplies from University Christian Church to Bluemont Elementary to assist in not sharing between students. A $4,000 cash donation from Riley County Raising Riley to Eugene Field Early Learning Center for behavioral and mental health support personnel. A $725 cash donation from the Christopher Brandt and Scott Terrell families to Manhattan High School for band supplies. $12,600 cash donation from the Riley County Raising Riley to College Hill Early Learning Center for reduced fees for families. A $3,520 cash grant from Kansas Department of Commerce Creative Arts Industries Commission to parents as teachers for production and purchase of Tap 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 Your Toe children's book to accompany the Tap to Togetherness program and a $900 cash donation from Cal STRs, which is Manhattan Town Center, grand for grades to Amanda Arnold, Marlette, Northview, Theodore Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson Elementary Schools for school supplies for a total of 5,000, sorry, for a total of $52,870. And item 6.5 on the consent agenda is site council members and meeting dates. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Madam President, I move to approve the consent agenda. All right, motion from uh, Katrina and I saw a second from Daryl. All in favor to approve the consent agenda? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you. For spoken reports, we have to start the Manhattan High School Council. If those students are here, I see. We'll invite you to come forward for your spoken report. Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with clubs. Sports. Sports. Okay. Um, first off, we're going to start with sports. Uh, boys soccer. Yeah, sure. Does this work? Cool. Um, boys soccer won against Hayden yesterday, 3-0. Um, I think their next game, I'm not sure when their next game is. Tomorrow. But tomorrow. It's their next game. Uh, volleyball, there's a home meet this Saturday, I think. Um, 
football, there's a game this Friday versus Washburn Rule, and uh, last week they played Seaman and they lost. Uh, girls golf won league last Monday, and regionals are this Monday. Um, girls tennis um, also won league at Topeka Crossover. Um, this is their third le- third year in a row that they won um, the league. Um, regionals are this Friday at Topeka Crossover, and uh, yeah, okay. pretty much it. Um, I'll go into clubs. Um, cl- club signups were last week. Um, group B students. Oh, club signups were last week for Group B students, and this week for Group A. Um, signups at the freshman center are on the thirteenth and sixteenth. Um, we will hopefully be see- start seeing more clubs um, be active soon. Um, Civic Engagement Club was voted to be an interest group this year. Um, We also have Asian Student Union that was voted to be a new official club this year. Um, Young Democrats Club and Young Republicans Club are in, well, for Young Democrats Club, we have voted to make them an interest group, and Young Republicans Club are in the process of making them an interest group. Um, Students Against Sexual Violence um, are... In the process of making it a club um, for pride the homecoming is october 19th through 23rd um, some updates on student council the regional conference the virtual one um, ended up being very successful um, we also sh- won a prize for a picture shared on instagram um, it was a cash prize and we are thinking about um, doing a teacher's appreciation or staff appreciation for that Um, The student council meeting will hopefully be held next week virtually. Um, We have a um, officers meeting tomorrow. Um, The blood drive, we will not be able to hold a blood drive at the school this year due to COVID, Um, but there will be a blood drive um, happening at one of the hotels and um, we are going to be able to advertise that if any students are wanting to participate in it. Um, For Mr. MHS, Um, That will be held in person this year with strict guidelines set in place, um, including limited seating and recorded performances for other students who want to watch it online. Um, We also, I think that was it for everything. Yep. Do you have any questions for them, Katrina? Yeah, thanks. The last time you two were here, I think it was both of you, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, okay. Um, I just asked for you to keep your ear to the ground, so to speak, about with your fellow students to figure out or to listen and to hear what they're experiencing. And we heard from one of your fellow students, Wesley, yep. earlier today, and she said hybrid's not working for her, and mm-hmm. she's a, obviously a very involved student. So uh, I, I would just like a, a perspective on that, on what you're hearing from um, your fellow involved classmates and, and maybe some others who... Um, aren't don't participate in school as much. Want to go first? Yeah, I can go. Um, so I guess personally, from my perspective, um, I think it just it really just depends on the classes and the different teachers. Um, different teachers do it their own ways. Every teacher has their own way of presenting the content from the from the um, class that they need to teach. I know that with my chemistry class, Mr. Andreessen has a very structured, um, um, very structured plan out for the week. He usually tells us um, a couple of days in advance when quizzes and things are like, you know, um, are in a couple of days, and so we have time to prepare for them. And um, sometimes I, there for other classes, um, such as um, my Spanish class taught by Mrs. Wilson. Um, we, she likes to post lectures, and we um, have to watch them over time and uh, on the remote days. And so different teachers kind of do different things, and you just kind of have to get – you kind of have to know how they teach to really, really, like, understand the content and succeed in their classes. And I understand that for every teacher that you have to do that for, it can be exhausting and tolling on a student. And so I've – Personally, it's been it's been hard with um, college applications and other extracurriculars that I'm involved in to really figure out each teacher. And I can understand from the perspective of Wesley the struggles that she's having to go through when trying to like deal with e- every teacher, if that makes sense. And so, 
Yeah, that's just what I have to say. Um, to add to that, I will agree with Dill um, in saying that it has been a little bit of a struggle for me um, figuring out how teachers have structured their class. I think it's getting easier over time. Um, I know certain teachers like post a lecture or if I know a certain teacher will put their assignments in modules so I know where to look for those assignments. Um, I will say if a student is not as good as like figuring out their teachers and where the teacher posts exact um, like due dates or assignments or like where the teacher will um, have their announcements, I will say um, hybrid is very tough with that. Um, I've been able to figure out most of my teachers' schedules and when they post certain things, so it's bit, been a bit of a learning curve. But other than that, um, I think some students, including myself, have a, overextended themselves with the clubs, um, like with grades. Um, I definitely can agree with Wesley that my grades right now are a not very accurate representation of how I usually do in school. Um, I'm not too worried about that, but I can understand how other students would be. Um, and it is also very hard balancing. Like I play tennis. I'm also involved in student council, um, some other clubs. I work, um, I have a part-time job that I participate in. I also babysit. I do a lot of other things, which it can be hard to have um, hybrid model um, and that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I also just wanted to add that all of my teachers have been willing to answer all of my questions. Um, I've never had an instance where a teacher has neglected me or like haven't helped me in any way if I had a question or concern or comment. So just, just to add to that. I had a different type of question. A couple of years ago, we looked at changing the start and stop times. This year, you've had kind of a unique opportunity of if it fits you better to sleep in, you could um, and stay up later. Have you noticed any difference in your sleep habits or your friend's sleep habits because of this or oh yeah, the ability um, to do your, your schoolwork? Um, it hasn't kind of hindered that. Like, I still get my stuff done. Um, I have some sort of a structure. I have like a list of things and I try to get those things done every day. Um, whether I wake up at seven or not should um, not be um, answered because I don't always do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. That's generous. Um, but yeah, it fluctuates sometimes and I just, I really, that's one thing that I do like about hybrid is that I don't have to, you know, wake up at 740 ne the next day. I kind of have like that kind of a leverage sort of, you know, just to like sleep in a little bit and then that way just do more work later on during the day um, rather than more um, in the morning. Um, yeah. So at the same time, are you staying up like at midnight, one in the morning doing stuff? Uh, some There are some days that I do. I catch myself staying up and then sleeping in. And I make sure that the next day I do need to get the stuff that I need to get done. Um, but yeah, I have been seeing like just different sleep patterns. Not like if I were to be in school for five days. Um, but I've definitely gotten more sleep. That's That's a benefit that I've noticed so um, I will add the hybrid model um, has its pros and cons with um, flexibility of time I think for self-motivated students it does um, it is nice to have that three days that you can structure your own time however you want I know that's been really nice especially with college applications because that is in a class that I'm able to work on that but I also can work on my um, school at a different time um, but I would also like to add that for students who are taking a lot of AP classes or are taking more rigorous courses this year, um, for instance, my brother, he is a sophomore and it's his first year taking AP classes and he decided to take three. And although he's doing well in them, um, I will say that um, part of it is I have taken some of those classes and I have to take time out of my schedule to um 
help him, which I don't mind, but for students who don't have that resource of like a parent or a teacher that's willing to stay on Zoom for a bit or like a sibling to help them, I will say that that might be a problem that I could see happening. Um, I also want to add, this is another point. I've noticed that like with the remote students for um, like elementary and middle school, they have to spend, uh, I feel like a significantly much more amount of time than um, high schoolers do on like screens and Zooms. I feel like high school is more of if you need to Zoom with the teacher, you can Zoom with them at your own time. If you need help, if you need anything. Um, yeah, that's just with me. There's just, I don't have to Zoom as, I don't feel like I have to Zoom as much as um, elementary school or middle school um, students. All right. Thank you guys for coming. All right. Thank yep. you. We thank look you. forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, thank you. Trisha, we'll have the construction update. Look out, Paula. Okay, so construction update um, from the last time we talked, and we'll move into Eugene Field and College Hill. Um, College Hill is moving right along. Um, if you've driven by there, you will notice that the east parking lot has been dug up. Um, there's a lot of earthwork going on, so they plan to hopefully have that poured back next week. Um, they are installing carpet on the east end of the building this week. All polished concrete is done in the building now. Uh, these are some pictures of the kitchen. The kitchen is done with the exception of a freezer and refrigerator that still need to come in from the supplier. Um, it's quite a large kitchen. I think the kitchen um, manager is going to be very happy she came and tour toured the space when there was no equipment in there. Um, all solid surface tops have been installed um, that have been templated. templated. Um, they came and templated the east half of the building, so those will be in um, in about three weeks. So they'll finish putting uh, solid surfaces in, and then also some window sills that didn't get done. The playground equipment, I'm sure you've driven by there, so the compound playground equipment has been delivered. Um, the company came in from Wichita that are doing the installation of the playground equipment, so they started to lay out equipment. Um, when I went by late this afternoon, they started working on the infant toddler playground. Um, they do have some pieces standing up and they started working on the boat. So the boat, I said, sits, sits still from one end of the property to the other end of the property. So it's, it's working. Um, the pieces are very large. Um, a lot of pieces and parts. Some of those crates have probably 50 or more pieces in them. Um, but I think it's going to be very exciting. The trike path, um, I don't have a picture of the trike path, but the trike path has been poured. Um, there it is to the top left. It's got some stamps in it of ducks and some paw prints um, to allow the kids imagination um, as they're riding their trikes around the trike path. So um, it's pretty exciting. All the short throw projectors have been installed. Um, we've put um, or garbage bags around them so the dust can stay out of them. Um, but I'm pretty excited uh, where Josh has gotten us so far uh, with College Hill. So um, we're hoping by the end of the month he'll be completely done. So we're, we're kind of really down to site work is what we have a lot um, left on College Hill. Uh, Eugene Field, we had another building committee meeting um, about a week and a half ago. It went very well. Um, Clint is really looking at the color palette that's kind of historical in color. Um, for that building since it's a, it is a historical old building. Um, we still have a few minor details to work out on the interior, um, with the, but the building layout is set. Um, there will be a, the playground that is on the southeast corner. Uh, the early learning um, childhood folks want to replace that with a like 
playground equipment that we're doing at College Hill. So that will be the southeast corner will have the same kind of playground equipment as also the new playground equipment on the north side of the building. So everything will be cohesive between Eugene Field and College Hill. They'll have all the same type of playground equipment. So um, there is going to be a community meeting on Monday, October 19th at 6.30 at Eugene Field. We will go over some, obviously the the layout of the building, Clint will have some more developed um, drawings to show as far as the site plan and stuff as that. So, um, and then we look to bid this out in November. We will be moving Eugene Field kids to College Hill once we move College Hill out of Trinity into their building, give them about a month to um, get used to it and then we'll move Eugene Field kids in with them at College Hill. Uh, moving on to Oliver Brown. Oliver Brown's moving right along. They get about 55 to 60 trade folks there a day. So it's a busy, busy, busy site. Uh, the Black Masons continue to work on bearing walls in Area B and then the west side of Area C. Uh, the Masons uh, continue to fall back and work on the critical path interior masonry walls in Area A and B. Um, the plumbers and electricians continue to work on their rough ends uh, with the walls. Uh, the brick and air, air barrier crews continue to work on the east side of the building. Uh, the air barriers that liquid applied um, barrier um, that keeps the moisture out of the block. So they continue to work. Steel erectors were there this week to work on some um, flying some steel. And so and then duct work is starting to be installed. You can see on the, the third picture or the second picture, whichever you want to say, that's the kitchen area actually. So um, where they have roofs already um, installed or laid, at least the steel decks, um, they are trying to put duct work down, trying to get that moving along. So, um, and metal panels are being installed, um, should be done with the gym by now, but, um, so it's moving right along. So I'm pretty pleased with what they're doing. Bergman Elementary. So BHS is continuing to working on footings for the new addition and the storm shelter. Uh, they're also pouring footings for that main entry for the office addition. Um, they are, the, the bid for phase two just ended yesterday. Um, I have not seen the bid results yet. Adam's supposed to get back to us later this week. Um, he's, from what I understand, everything came in favorable. Um, they didn't come over budget. So, but there's not a lot of wiggle room is what he said. So we will bring those bids to facilities and growth next week on October 14th. And we'll bring the GMP to the board on October 21st as well. Eisenhower and Anthony Middle School um, continually with uh, at AMS area E should be dried in by the end of the week as far as the roofing. Um, a delivery of ductwork has arrived on site, so they'll try to do the same thing um, to install ductwork. Uh, as long as there's a roof over there, um, over the sections, they'll install the ductwork. If there's not, they're going to wrap the ductwork. Area F bar joists are going in over the locker rooms. Um, fire sprinkler contract is also starting to run pipe over at Anthony, um, and the last precast panel was set uh, the other day. At a EMS, kind of same thing, Area E is being decked out for roofing. Um, they need to have some decking inspections, so uh, they, those need to happen before they can move to the next section for decking to go down. Um, they also had a delivery of duct work is installed as well, so they do the same thing that AMS is doing. Uh, Joyce will be now set um, over the storm shelter. Um, and they will be setting the cooling tower that's sitting out in the parking lot um, the weekend of October 23rd. So that will be finally getting out of the parking lot. But the, the aerials that he has um, gone through, those are recent aerials just about a week ago. Manhattan High School. So they're plugging along over there. Subcontractor, um, they've been tying cages for the piers. Drill piers will be done by the end of this week. There's about 74 drill piers on the west side of the building. Um, the, the, they will start working on the underground rough end for the locker rooms um, next week. Um, they will also begin to work on the grade beams as well next week. Um, there's some mezzanine steel beams that need to come out between the north gym and the south gym, which used to be where all the storage was. Um, it was supposed to be done about two weeks ago, but the company dropped their forklift off a trailer and it was the only type of forklift <laughs> that could take these steel beams out. So they have finally relocated a uh, forklift to come do this. So um, that's going to happen next week. They are pouring a uh, curb and gutter for the new north lot. Um, 
this week. Um, and then hopefully the retaining wall material will be here. Um, it's just, it's just say the first week of uh, November. So they can start that retaining wall. That picture is a recent picture as well of the aerial. Uh, tried to put two together to kind of show you the magnitude of the work that's happening um, on the west side as far as the building pad and uh, the work that's being done on that north parking lot. The other projects we're working on, Marlette, uh, we did have a Zoom meeting today at 10 o'clock. Um, BG, the team out of Lawrence went over the drawings, um, literally uh, what we're gonna do in the kitchen, what's gonna happen um, as far as the classroom renovations. There's two, there's kind of two different layouts because there's two different layouts to the classrooms, frankly. Um, so there's a layout A, if you have a mechanical room, here's what your case source is gonna look like. Here's layout B, if you don't have a mechanical room, this is what your case source is gonna look like. We will do an alternate for the elevator. If we don't, if we don't have to take it, we're not gonna take it, but we are just gonna go ahead and bid it out um, just as an alternate, an alternate. I did ask them how the lift is working. They said it's working just fine. They have had no problems. I reminded them to keep using it. To, uh, try to use the lift every day if they could possibly use it. So um, we will be looking at bidding this out in November as well. Um, warehouse, so the warehouse, we were sent uh, plans last week. I marked them up, sent back all my markups. They will be delivering plans. Gould Evans will be delivering plans to McCown Gordon. And we hope to have those out to bid um, by the end of next week. And we hope to be bringing bids to you um, sometime in probably November for the warehouse. So it's moving along. We are gonna, we did sign a contract with Olson to do some core drilling, um, some soil bearing drills, um, what the Corps of Engineers needs us to do. It's their requirements, so. That is what I have and I'm more than happy to answer. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Kurt. Well, I'll, I could ask this later, right? We can kill two birds with one stone here. Yep. So um, with the increase, so it looks like almost a million dollars in the uh, um, the Anthony and Eisenhower projects. How, what was that? How much were we under at that point? Is that gonna put us over and seem like we were gonna use some of that money to do that extra storage space at the high school right so yeah so with the where the bids came in and where it all is shook out we've already moved um how how much jamie about a million eight hundred and some odd thousands already over to um the high school so and we will get some uh, savings back uh, contingency savings back from them so um, we still haven't there's still change orders happening um, as we go, but yeah. um, I think we'll have a favorable return back on this project. Okay. Does that answer your question? I, I think okay. also I'll throw in there that those are the alternates that we had bid out at the very beginning of that process, right. and we were waiting on bids to close it, mm -hmm. the West Campus, before we committed to those alternates on the middle school. So but budget-wise, we should be fine. Right. I mean, I, I know change orders are going to happen. And in fact, I'm surprised that we haven't yeah. had more. Yeah, and we've, this is very few. we held that money kind of separately right, yeah. aside um, because we knew we were going to take those and accept those. So we okay. kind of. That was kind of our it. catastrophic contingency would be, <laughs> would have been to give those up and, yeah. or make some difficult choices on what we cut back with on the high school, but it turned out we didn't have to do any of that. Right. So we were able to win on both sides, I think. Right. Okay. Katrina. Hey, thank you so much for all of the updates. Really informative, and I appreciate that things are moving along. I was wondering if you could talk about that community meeting on October the 19th mm -hmm. with Eugene Field. What's the purpose of that meeting? So the purpose of that is to, because I've been having conversations with a couple of the, um, the gentlemen that was here, um, and Mary Lou, I've had conversations. I've, I've had a Zoom meeting with them, but I've also had some emails going back and forth talking about the green space and that it is uh, district property. So we have come to a point where we need to just let the community know, and I've been talking with Eric and also with Clint, that we need to, we need to show the plans, we need to show where we are. Because um, it's not just, you know, the concerns about the green space. There's also a gentleman that lives right um, adjacent to the alleyway. Um, so it affects him as well. And I've been having conver conversations with him as well trying to update him on 
how the alleyway, because we have to widen it some, how it affects his drive into his garage. Um, it's kind of an odd situation with him because he's actually built on our property. Um, he's quite a ways into our property line. But I think if we sit and have conversation with each other, I think we can come to an amicable um, solution. Um, he's actually going to get a new retaining wall. Um, but as far as the green space, we've had lots of conversation about the green space. Clint has done a design where there is property. Um, there will be a playground up north. Yes, there is going to be a parking lot. Um, but there's also going to be some green space, actual green grass uh, left in the design. And Elizabeth and Andy and Brandy, um, I just gave them the information from Mary Lou and Tim, gave them their email addresses. They... Um, I asked them if they would be receptive to talk to um, Elizabeth and her folks about our folks writing a grant to replace that playground equipment. That playground equipment is 12 years old. Um, and by the time we take it out, I don't, I can't guarantee the shape that it's going to be in. Um, but Elizabeth's more than happy to work on writing a grant to replace that playground equipment and put it in that green space that we have allocated for the community. And, and can you or maybe Eric help us to understand is what exactly is the issue? Because I was a little bit surprised to hear folks come speak tonight. I hadn't received any emails about that. Um, and from my perspective, this was all part of the district plan as part of our bond issue. And yeah. so that's what surprised me a, a, a bit. Well, I didn't really understand what the contention was about. I was kind of surprised, too, because I thought our conversations, I thought my conversations with Tim and Mary Lou were going very well. So I was kind of surprised. And I was kind of surprised because I had sent them an email and said, hey, by the way, Elizabeth and Andy and Brandy are very happy to write a grant to replace that playground equipment. And I've told them all along we were saving space um, within that north portion of the lot. Um, they've understood that that north port, I have told them several times that north portion of that lot is district property. It's not city property, it's district property. Um, so yes, our building is going that direction, but it also, playground has to go that direction too. And I think that's been part of the issue. We have had a plan out there three years with buildings up and parking lots up over there, but sometimes until it's getting up to close time and I think there has been some misunderstanding of who did own that land there. Cause I mean, there was, there was a broad assumption. I heard it multiple times. Um, that, well, that's a community park, that's city property, that's community park. And it's not, it's district property or it was part of the public square. It's not part of the public square. It's we, we acquired that property. The public square is where the Eugene field area currently is. So the district extended back in there long time ago, quite quite a while ago, but we've kind of left it there. Now the plan does take away a lot of that green space and the Frisbee space and being able to do that. Um, but it also provides the early childhood needs that we have and we don't have another location um, to provide that as well. So it's going to be competing things and I totally understand that, but that's why we set the meeting up. Um, that's been on the radar for, for a long time because we know that community is they're tight. They're very well supportive and they're, they're a good, good community. And you want to be letting them know what's going on in that area. So, yeah, we've been planning to have that meeting for a long time. We just didn't have the plan and far enough along to show them out outside of the, like the original bond plans that we had, which like I said, went, went through that too. We, we've shown that all the way. So it's not like we're is it slide a hand and change in last minute that that's been there the whole time. It's just, it looks a little different than it did before. And can you help me to understand one more thing? This might be a silly question, but you know, in off hours, I oftentimes take my kids to school playgrounds. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that or not, but I, I, you know, we, we go play after school. Hey, Is you're that... a really bad person for doing that. Well, I, I, <laughs> no. I think that they're open, but now that I say that out loud, I, that's what I'm wondering is in off hours. Is that still going to be available space to those community members? A lot of the playgrounds on the early learning centers have been locked in. What's the rules gonna on be, that? They're, they're going to be locked because they have to have a, they have to have a panic bar on them. Um, so that's part of codes. We have to have gates on them and the panic bars. 
Um, they will be locked because we don't, they don't want to allow people into them, especially when there's kids. Um, I think it's a safety issue. So, and, and it's they, a little different because it's an early learning yeah. center, um, have some different rules to follow than an open playground on an elementary school. So there's, there's some differences there too. And I think also at the beginning, when, when you go into that, they're age appropriate materials, um, playground equipment right. within that area. So it's not the typical park that everybody plays on until they're 12, you know, and so you get kids way oversized for the equipment, um, playing on younger kid equipments because it's locked into that grade or age levels. I, the reason you brought up 2009 is because that was a big deal with the board because that playground was closed. And but it's because, like you said, it's specialized equipment. It had to be, you know, handicap accessible, and we, the school there didn't want possible damage to the to the and it's really expensive too so that's why those playgrounds were closed yeah but to answer your question our general elementary school playgrounds are accessible people can come play there i think there's signs on most of them past dark you're not a bad person katrina so <laughs> last, last comment on yeah. that one I, if any of the community members are still here who spoke about that thank you for coming because i think that 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 is how this should work that if there are concerns, we should be able to voice our, our concerns. And uh, I'm glad we're having a community meeting about it. Let's meet, let's talk about it, let's find an amicable solution and and put the plans out there. I mean, we heard from from um, some speakers on, on hybrid model tonight. Let's communicate, let's put that out there. And I that's what surprised me that, oh, well, I thought that I this was common knowledge, but you're right, once, the construction starts happening, I think people are caught off guard because our reality of what we're talking about at the board table every other week isn't what's on, uh, you know, dinner time discussion around everyone's table until it's in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having that community discussion. I'll sure. see if I can go to that. Okay. What time is that meeting? Six, 6.30 on the 19th at Eugene Field. Uh, and two other questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, at some point, do we need to address the garage on our property? The garage is not on our property. Part of the driveway is. So that's part of the conversation that I've been having with um, the gentleman that lives there. So as soon as more developed plans for the site um, get developed, then Clint and I and Mr. Cohen, I think is how you say his last name, we're gonna have to sit down and have a conversation just specifically with him because it the um, the alleyway affects him only, nobody else. Yeah, I just being an old realtor, there's squatters type rights after ten years, yeah. and I just didn't want us to you know, yeah, I understand. fall into that. Uh, the other thing I I would like if we make, and I'm saying this is a big if. We make any changes in the way, uh, whether we go hybrid or uh, on-site or whatever, is there any repercussions that would have on construction? Um, as far as any construction or? Yeah. I mean, any of my projects? Any of our current projects. No. Um, I will tell you that EMS and AMS has actually kind of helped me out um, because at AMS, I have to get that new lighting that Matt had already done um, with EMS. So Jeremy's able to sneak in there on Wednesdays and do a couple of the rooms at a time, switching out the lighting and stuff. So that's actually helping me. Um, then he does, that's less work than he has to do this summer because um, we still have obviously construction stuff to do this summer. So it's less that he has to do this summer. So it's kind of helping me um, as far as the like the high school goes, it's it's not going to affect me because right now everything's on the outside. Um, anything that's going to be done on the inside is going to be done over the summertime as far as construction goes at the high school. So it's it's really not going to affect. And when you get to uh, Marlette, it's the summertime. Bergman, with the exception of the front entry, it's all summertime work. Mm -hmm. They'll ask me about it an awful lot because I, you know, obviously if there's less kids or no kids there, they can do a little more construction wise. My answer is always don't count on it. <laughs> don't count on it. I mean, they need to 
be planning for us to be there to use it for the function it belongs with and it's bonus for them on their end. I'm not going to say it's bonus on my end if they can't, but it's a bonus on their end if they can take advantage of those days that they can sneak in and do something. But my answer is always, and Trish no. knows this well, No, don't count on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just, okay. you know, if we talk about any of this stuff, I want to know everything that it affects. Right. Okay. Not just okay. one or two things. Any other questions for Tricia? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll see you back in a few minutes, I think. Or at least you'll be around. Dr. Wade, superintendent report. Good. Two items I'd like to bring to the board's attention. One would be uh, redistricting, that there's still work going on in that area. I'd like Eric to give a, a quick update on that. Yeah, we, we've had multiple meetings on the redistricting team. Um, most recent was yesterday. Wow, a lot's happened in a day. Um, so we're kind of getting down to the point where our intention was to have something ready to take to the public in November. Um, I believe the first full week of November, um, we're planning on having public presentations on that and be able to comment back. COVID kind of changes how we do that, but we still intend to do that in some capacity. So hopefully I can get a better plan and tell you guys next meeting what, what we'd like those to look, look like. Um, could be a presentation that's put on video and we ask people to video and comment. Um, there's, there's some different options that RSP has been working on to try, try to do this too. Um, but the questions I have for the board, I have, I have two main questions and Carla, you can help me if you, if I'm missing any of these main questions. Um, Kurt was on for most of that meeting yesterday too. Um, we're, we're running into, you know, trying to keep all the priorities that we set for the board, I think they've been very faithful to try and do those things, but we're running into the point where some of the neighborhoods are getting broke up in the name of um, balance, diversity, trying to spread our diversity out while also trying to keep um, some of our qualifications for the federal programs, be it title, um, which you need 40% free and reduced to be a title one school. That's important. That's a lot of resources. You know, I want to say eight hundred thousand dollars resources come in through our Title One funds. Um, summer feeding. It's it's one of those things we tout um, that we talk about that we highlight Stephanie with is how many meals she makes access during the summer. Well, if if you don't have fifty percent free reduced in your building, you're not a qualifier for um, summer lunch program. So we we have to have those buildings set up in order to qualify for those programs. And the way the rules set out, we, we've been looking at, and I think I've thrown this out to you guys too, that we looked at our feeder system where your elementary schools feed into a specific middle school and everybody feeds up into the high school. And we talked about the regional system where it's just, okay, we, we, we take away the strict, this building to this building and get this area to this area. And we've kind of looked at that a lot of the opinions gone away they'd really like to get to a feeder system if possible but it's hard to balance that out um, one way or other especially with the diversity and making it look right on the map um, otherwise you get into some it looks uh, gerrymandering if everybody remembers high school government when i used to taught why the congressional districts look certain ways is because they're gerrymanding certain things and we would be doing the same thing to gerrymander certain areas in the town to get the numbers of students to balance. So we're not filling a building at the very beginning to try to keep our capacity spread out across the board. Um, but I guess it, that goes a long way around to ask two things of feedback that I would like from you guys is when, when we look at that neighborhood balance versus the long-term viability and diversity piece, what is the most important to us as a board, to you as a board, I guess I'm not on the board, but I think we look at this collectively. I'll own this with you, but what, what's the most important piece as, as we finalize that, I'll, I'll let you go there before I ask my second question. 
Carla and Kurt, I might ask you first, since you've had more time to think about this than my other friends on the board. Yeah, you're asking for us. Us first. <clears throat> well, I think you know my feeling that, well, I, I, feel, I feel pretty strongly, at least initially, uh, last, I think last week when we had a meeting, that I think having feeder schools is critical because um, we could, I mean, by going, especially since we're going to have six, we'll have three years of school in a middle school. Um, so we could, I mean, potentially what that means is if we don't, if we just do a geographic feeder system, then there could be kids half of one class and t at Theodore Roosevelt could go to Eisenhower and the other half could go to Anthony. And so I, that's why I think I, I prefer to, if at all possible, and, and I was corrected. I thought, I thought, I mean, I know the middle schools are really close right now, but that's because there's a lot of transfers being done mm -hmm. between the schools. So, but if at all possible, I would like to see it maintained as a feeder so the classes can stay together. I think one of the things that, that we could see yesterday when we were looking at the different map options, and it's really talking about that movement from elementary school to middle school, I think is what you're really getting at and wanting, needing feedback from us on um, was that, that the way that if we stay with a complete feeder system to where certain schools go to a certain middle school, um, that first off, geographically, the way that we're set right now, Oliver Brown would go to Eisenhower, which makes sense to all of us, I think. But if we just put Oliver Brown straight in, then that puts, out of 10 elementary schools, it puts six schools at Eisenhower and four schools at Anthony, which very much would put things out of whack in a number of different ways. So it's looking at, well, okay, well, which school then could shift over to Anthony and, and stay true to what we've put forth as those goals of um, diversity equity, balancing out student population. I mean, those the two physical plants are the same. So it's not really realistic to think that one school can support a whole lot more than the other school. Um, but then when we were looking at the, the challenge, I think comes from, and, and we were in a meeting with a great group of people, but, the, but one thing I had to keep remembering was that it was, um, just by the sheer nature of who we are and who was there, it's mostly elementary school principals who were concerned, I think, about um, about having islands, like, you know, in a neighborhood you have this certain population. Well, that happens because they go to a certain elementary school. And so I think there was concerns about if it would move and impact um, having like within a certain neighborhood, some kids go to Eisenhower, some kids go to Anthony. But then remembering that if we stay with a complete feeder system, you would still be moving with your entire school versus if we switched to a geographic split, then you would have part of your school go to one middle school and part of your school go to a different middle school possibly because of how those boundaries are. So I don't know that that helped clarify things at all about what you're kind of getting at. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to throw, yeah, yeah. Eric, can you clarify what the ask is of us right now? Because I'm not entirely yeah. sure what you're looking for guidance for us from. How, are, are you guys on, on this specific thing? And I guess I'm going to change where I got three questions. Um, the feeder system versus just the regional, you know, cut it down college and the weave your way system through into some the middle schools. Yeah, yeah feeding okay. into middle schools. Um, I'm going to give another half of the narrative that I didn't give that on a feeder system um, and qualifications for summer feeding is, is 50 percent. That can be at a building. If a middle school qualifies for 50 percent, all the feeders can be qualified underneath that middle school. Or if an elementary school qualifies, their middle school can if it's a feeder system. If we got rid of the feeder system and it's just regional, so let's let's say one of my elementary buildings, um, Bluemont's been one that's been a qualifier. So if Bluemont's a qualifier, 
whatever middle school they would go to would be an automatic qualifier for a, for a program. Um, but if we went regional and we cut it, even though Bluemont qualifies, whatever middle school would not. So I, I guess these, my two questions, my first two questions that I had was, well, how do you feel about the feeder system? Or, or do you still want us to explore the open system or stick with the feeders? Because if we, if we bring multiple options on public comment, it's going to be more difficult to explain and understand because those things don't matter that much to people on public comment. They're just looking at the street and want to know where they go. So for you guys on your end, you know, do we want to stick with a feeder system or do we want that open system? And the same thing, part B of that question would be, do you want to make sure we have at least some eligibility for our summer feeding program? Because as a district, we're about 40% free reduced, which means I, we could draw those boundaries so we would add no qualifiers for that if we so chose. I don't know if that's beneficial to you, but uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're fighting against two things is you got a population of people that depend on that, need that, want that, and we have a desire to try to be as equitable as possible. And those two things are just gonna butt heads if we fix, if, if we spread the diversity out, then I'm, I spread my free reduce and I lose the qualifiers. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. Katrina? I, I, I think, so if I hear you correct, what you're saying is that if we go geographic instead of the feeder schools, then an eligible school for summer feeding program at an elementary school in a feeder school situation would also make the middle school eligible. And if we don't do that, then the middle school will not become a summer yeah. feeding location and, and there is related funding that we would lose. A, a feeder system is gonna give you more flexibility for those qualifications for programs than, but the limit, the just zoned areas, we'd be able to balance much easier as, as far as all, all the qualifiers free reduced, um, ethnic, in anything, language, ESOL qualifiers. We could balance that very easily, not using a feeder system more so than we can. And that's okay. I mean, um, equitable doesn't mean equal. And I think we said that time and time again, you wanna make sure the resources go where they're needed to go and, and we can do that. So I guess what I'm saying is, and Carla, Kurt, you helped me out. We, we're see, just seeing those competing interests of how balanced do we wanna be versus um, qualifying for some of those programs that we know people depend on. So with the feeder school option, are we more worried about the population of the two middle schools getting out of whack? It, it more so, it, it could. Well, diversity wise, but then just also, I mean, because the east side of town is having so much more new building, yes. it wouldn't be very hard for that Eisenhower growth to really change quickly versus with the dividing line, if we had to just change one little bit one year or something, yes, it'd be easier to make slight. Otherwise we're gonna be back to force transfers probably like we are now. Oh. It, Potentially. Not if we flipped one of the other elementary schools and made them an Anthony feeder instead of an Eisenhower, which I think could very much Maybe happen answer. too. So, and that and that's a second order change for a lot of people too, because you know they, they're comfortable going their direction, which I love. I, I love that they like their middle school they feed into. Um, but but we, we wouldn't there. be able to keep the same plus add Oliver Brown on an Eisenhower feeder. We would be well out of balance very, very quickly. But if we keep a whole school together, it wouldn't be quite as significant. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that I don't even remember what our original criteria were. <laughs> we, we, I, I jotted down as we were speaking diversity, equity, balance, but I I feel like we're being asked to make a decision and I don't have oh, all of Oh, you're not making a decision, just your thoughts. Your, your thoughts will help guide me to give them their thoughts. So that's okay. It's hard, it's hard to, from my perspective, to give guidance when I don't feel like I fully understand all of the bits and pieces of this, um, this narrative right now. Okay. Of, and, and, and Carla and Kurt, it sounds like you have a lot more um, current information if you've been part of these discussions as part of that committee. So I, I think that I would probably lead on you. I, I, 
Sorry to put you on the spot, Carla, but that's where I'm at. I, I think we're fine with that. I just knew we were to the point where if I didn't, if, if you had strong opinions on this, I, I'd rather them come out now than come out later. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to Brandy and then Daryl and then back to Kurt. Um, I'm gonna take a different perspective. Uh, I, after hearing this, you know, part of the reason why I'm here is because you do get shifted around. Mm -hmm. And I think people in our community, especially those with children, look mm -hmm. for a home um, in that school, in that school area, and then it is a very unfortunate situation where we do get shifted around. Um, that being said, I really think geographical uh, criteria is very important, and I think it provides a sense of community in my small neighborhood of, what, 30 homes? We have four different schools. I can tell you that my children do not play with anyone in our community because they do not know them. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just think that diversity is important. I think that lines can be drawn so that you do have that equity, but I think geography is tremendously important, at least to me. So. I will say, just from being on it and looking at the maps, that, and one of the goals that we did talk about was, con is it contiguous? Contiguous, Contiguous yes. being the word. Mm -hmm. So having your um, boundaries drawn is, as solid to a neighborhood as we can achieve. And I think a lot of where you're at, probably a lot of that, probably most of that is um, forced transfers because of being overcrowded would be my, my instinct. So I think this, this um, process, no matter what, should solve a good portion of that because both of the maps, both types of maps that we've been looking at on that committee have have um, addressed a lot of trying to get neighborhoods staying together. Um, obviously, you can't do that 100% fidelity all the time, but much more so probably. And then obviously, obviously moving away from having to force transfer people yeah. to where they're not in their neighborhood school. They're not in their school that they would be. Yeah, I, I think definitely, Brandy, there, there's a push to make sure, and, and that's why I say, if we draw these boundaries where we're near capacity, it's not very long where we're in that situation where we are doing that to neighborhoods de facto. Whether we draw a line there or not, if we have too much capacity in a neighborhood, we end up doing that anyway. So drawing those boundaries within that so those kids are zoned to those same schools and we have room to grow inside those same schools is important to us. And if I can just add, I would definitely support that. I just really feel like geography is is more important than the feeder system, uh, specifically because of the 300 or 500 kids that go to that school, you know, and you do, and you question, okay, who are your friends and this and that. Um, and I can say the same thing. I don't have, there hasn't been one child in um, either of my kids' this class. Oh, that's not true. There's two kids but um, that come to my house. Because again, we're in a school that's not in, mm -hmm. in our neighborhood. So I'm just saying that when you're looking at feeder, you know, taking the whole school and putting them there, that doesn't mean you know, their best friends are there. There's other recreational activities and there's other um, opportunities to keep that emotional and social um, stability as well. So I just, I would just wanna say for feeders, it, it, it's not the all end answer, at least yeah. not for me. Great. I don't remember. I think I said Daryl next. <laughs> and then yeah. Well, the only thing that, that I find the most important is the summer feeding program, how we maintain that. I mean, just like Chris came from Ogden and was talking about the kids there and, and the numbers that have grown since I've been on the board from 75 to 300 or so homeless kids. I think it's, it's important that we maintain the, that summer feeding program. I also love the idea of diverse. I think part of the education is having a diversified crowd. Uh, you know, you have 40 different nationalities in the school or, and social economic backgrounds, I think it's a huge educational opportunity. 
So I, I guess that's my two main thoughts, whether it's a feeder system or regional, whichever works or how that works out the best. Um, I, I, I love a feeder program because when you go to a seventh grade and everything is complicated and you have a few of your friends that came with you, you know, feeding from the same classroom you were in, it really helps stabilize you a little bit. So I kind of like that, but you know, uh, kids are pretty adaptive too. So, I mean, look what they've done this year. <laughs> Kurt. And thank you for your perspective. I hadn't thought about it from that, from that angle. So I thought that was a well thought out, but I, you know, I just, I just worry, not worry. I'm like, we want to maintain, I get, think it gives us more options as far as feeder feeding programs in the summer, if we can maintain the feeder system. And, and then one example that we looked at was that Ogden would go to um, Anthony. Don't, don't they go to Eisenhower now or they go to no. Ogden goes to Anthony. Anthony. They go yeah. Anthony. Oh, they okay. have. So that, so that helps with that diversity there. And that would qualifies Anthony for a feeder system but you know but we could also be looking if we go to geographic we could have kids that go to school for six years together and or five years fifth once they hit fifth grade and the kids across the street from each other would go to separate schools so that's only i mean it, there's pros and cons to both that's why we were kind of wrestling with it mm -hmm. kristen did you have something to share oh i was just gonna say i in many ways agree with brandy i guess the to me that losing all the funding for the school lunch thing, I guess would be the make or break thing. But I mean, if you knew when you bought a house, you know, at least your neighborhood was gonna, you know, maybe not your whole school, but at least the kids on your block are gonna go with you to the same same area. I don't think that's that bad. It's only two schools and they're all gonna get to back together in high school. And half the time, it seems like everyone I know, they're, they're best friends on a different team with them anyway in middle school. So they feel <laughs> like their life, you know. I've heard that once or twice. Yeah, so I mean, it's one adjustment one time. I don't know, but but it would be a huge blow to lose all that summer feeding money. So that would definitely be a deciding factor, I think. I'm, I'm seeing nods and that does help. Um, second question would be, they can present us a lot of, a lot of ways. And one of the th questions was for them, do you want them to hone into one option that can just be adjusted here and there and we can move things around or do we want to see multiple options i'm seeing head shakes no one option. one option that we can adjust because i do think we need to be open to adjust one option okay and i, I think that's fine and that that'll help with some explanation pieces as well i i believe so any comments on that kurt C carla okay no, that, that was B. The second one is summer summer feeding along with the feeder. So my, my answer that I take from you guys is do the best we can on the feeder regional. Keep, try to keep the neighborhoods intact as best possible. Consider the feeder system as long as it does keep groups together. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Fair. Okay. We'll do the best we can on that. Um, Dr. Wade, I'm going to steal one more thing real quick. Sorry that took so long. Um, just want to let you know, Dr. Ribble and I are also working on a, uh, new wireless internet and we, we know the Khajiits and their life is coming up and that's a question we've had multiple times. Um, we started working with the T-Mobile on their access push to try and get, um, internet into the hands of the families, um, that qualify. So we've been dipping into that and see what the qualifiers were. Um, just wanted to let you know that conversations out there have been working on funding sources and what we would need to upgrade the package. Basically what the T-Mobile plan will provide for free, it really isn't enough um, when you're talking about video conferencing or you know downloading videos. It was very minimal, but you can upgrade at a cost, but the cost is much less than what we're currently at with the Khajiit program. So we're in process of weighing those things out and trying to do that and maximize what we can do for our kids if we know remote learning is a continued thing which we know it will be on some capacity for the rest of this year so just wanted to put that on your radar i appreciate that thank you i think that's good for us to know because you're right that is a question that we've had and mm -hmm. a concern that that we've had as we knew the khajiits were coming towards their end and um, we know how important that is okay continuing back to dr wade 
Okay, that concludes the superintendent report for tonight. All right, Aaron Meyer Gambrell, would you please join us at the table for the NEA Manhattan Ogden report? I know. So this shout out at the board meeting goes to the uh, Manhattan Teachers Facebook gift page that has recently been started. This was a gift from a patron for my remote classroom. So it also happens to be a building rep for uh, the association. So yeah, that was an unexpected blessing, but yes, it is very colorful. And um, the keyboard is colorful too, which makes all the fun like typing. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and start with the board report. Okay, um, we've had a lot happen in the three weeks since we had our last meeting. And um, I'd like to start with um, an analogy of juggling the balls that I heard about a month ago, which is everyone has balls in their life. Some are glass and some are plastic, and we are all juggling balls. The goal is that we are keeping the glass balls juggling while minimizing the plastic balls, which are dropping. We'll open with that. I'd like to address the fact that after our last board meeting, I had a significant amount of staff reach out to me regarding backhanded compliments that they felt like came at that board meeting. That educators are not babysitters, we're educators. The relationship that staff was feeling with the Board of Education has waned as a result from that incident. Your staff is hemorrhaging. The remote school does not have enough support staff or title staff to support 857 elementary students. You have doubled the staff load to teach in person and remotely, specifically at the middle school and the high school. There are also different types of teaching skills and pedagogy that go along with both of those, in person and remote. Safety measures are not always being followed, but money can't solve these issues. We're a 6A size, but staff is not compensated for 6A work. We're doubling up to cover up the staff that didn't return or resigned or retired. So what are the needs? Because that was something that a parent brought up tonight. So I wanna address the needs because this is important. And I know that this is really small and now I'm wishing I'd chosen a different layout option. So I'm very sorry. Okay, the needs that we have, we have certified staff. There aren't enough certified staff to do some of the positions and some of the jobs that we have. I'd like to believe that this is a temporary because my optimistic side says come December, we will hopefully have more graduates. We will have people who are willing to apply to come for a second term in district to apply for these positions. We're also seeing that there are positions that have been unfilled since August, making this difficult. We have classified staff who have resigned or who are not wanting to put in for positions because of the risk, which puts us in a bind with legal obligations or we have a paraprofessional, but they are being pulled as a substitute teacher if they happen to have a substitute license and we are short because you can't teach if you don't, and we can't have kids if there's not someone there, which takes us to the next issue, which is substitute shortage. We can't find enough people. And as a result of not being able to find enough people, there isn't enough staff in the building to support them. You have a remote school which has educators that are at capacity. You have administrators at the elementary and secondary level who are doing double duty. Both of them are directors of education in addition to being an administrator for an elementary building or for a secondary building. You also have, um, for example, 36 kids in a first grade classroom. 36 kids in a remote elementary setting is very difficult to teach in any setting that's difficult, but especially remotely. I'd like to add that there are some fifth grade classrooms that have 30 students in them with half of them already identified with IEP needs, not even looking at ones that are potentially identified. So when we think about that, we wouldn't have done that necessarily in person 
but you have these different things that are occurring because we had situations we could not plan for. We also have a lack of communication with positive tests. So if there is a test positive, that communication can take multiple days to come down sometimes from the health department, whether you're in Pot County or Riley County, to then turn around and then notify people that yes, you were a positive case, which does put individuals at risk because they were potentially a close contact causing that domino effect. So that is a need as well. We also have space. We have social distancing or class sizes. That is a need as well. Currently, um, we're teaching in a way that we can meet the social distancing or the guidelines for classrooms to meet student needs. However, we've had some shifts with that. Um, I'll use Bergman as an example. The special ed department was moved this week because of construction. So now you have an entire special education team that now has nowhere else to go in the building because we were doing construction to expand in the first place. So there's just, there's a lot of dominoes that are happening that I think we also need to consider too with moving forward. We also have um, community spacing needs, but I'm also optimistic on this because we have Governor Kelly's grant that she has put out as of this past Friday that can hopefully be looking at alternative community spacing. So what's happened since the last meeting? We've had the staff survey, and I know Dr. Wade and the district leadership will be sharing that tonight. We have the labor task force that'll be meeting tomorrow that has not met since our last meeting. We also have the medical community um, task force, and that has been on a weekly meeting since last, uh, since September 16th. So we've had two meetings. We have another scheduled in October, uh, I think in two weeks. So that comes down to what should we do? Well, like anything, that it's a 50-50 split. I know that I'm hearing both sides. I know you're hearing both sides. I know from uh, the high school, I'm getting both sides. I can't make a recommendation because I'm hearing it on both ends. If we go with hybrid and continue, we have social distancing. You have staff that are able to better serve based upon student numbers at the high school and middle school. You have your current class schedule and it doesn't have to change. Your class sizes remain small and some of those class schedules were created simply because social distancing was the plan with the hybrid. It also hopefully keeps our community numbers of COVID low. However, if we go to a four or a five day week, we have more students in person you trade that off for a lack of social distancing, but you do have regular in-person learning and attendance. You also get more of a sense of community because kids are there with each other and they're building those relationships, which as we've heard tonight, mental health is suffering. From the social workers that I have talked to and had reached out to me, students are suffering and they're having meltdowns. It wasn't necessarily at the beginning, but we're starting to see a domino effect. You also have um, social services that are provided at a better level because you are seeing students more regularly. So we have a house of cards. Moving to a four and five day can pull your hybrid kids and force them to go remote, creating even larger class sizes on those remote teachers. You also have staff who are in quarantine or are currently out for a 72 hour rule. That number can go up too. Our case numbers of a community have dropped, but our staff out has increased over the last two weeks with quarantine. We were already short staffed to start. It doesn't matter what we choose because not everyone's gonna be happy with the choice that comes out, which again is why I can't make a recommendation. We have a tough decision to be made and I'm not the person to make that decision. So celebrating what's right, this is when I drop a plastic ball. So this is why we opened with, it'll resume at some point. We have a new award, it's with the alms group. It's for 
philanthropy. I'm really excited about it. Sorry, I shouldn't be like emotionally crying. I'm just so excited. Okay, so I talked about this last year and it's taken us, or even a year and a half ago, it just seems to take a while to get things going. But the alms group has graciously started a new uh, uh, philanthropic award. It's $300 for a classified staff or a certified staff member in the district, bus driver, lunch ladies, custodians, um, librarians, secretaries. I mean, we have all these wonderful people that need recognition too. So we will get the chance to honor both classified staff in addition to certified staff. On their website, if you go to the philanthropic tab and select award, there are two. One of them is the E2 award, which stands for the Educator Excellence Award. The second one is the CEERA, which stands for Classified Educator Excellence Recognition Award. And again, the process is two letters are needed from either staff, parents, or students. And then a committee will get together to make the determination. So hopefully in the midst of um, all of this, people will think about how they can help to celebrate what's right beyond just me recognizing. What's There's a really right. cool video on there too. There's a really cool video with some amazing people that I know on it. So I would highly encourage you to go and check it out. So are there any questions for me? Erin, you're teaching remotely. Yes. And I'm curious if in your perspective, your firsthand perspective, have things been better for you as a remote teacher? Are you getting the hang of it? Or are there new problems that have cropped up? There are new problems that come. As anything that happens, you have expectations that are needing to be met. And you have um, services that need to be provided. But there's not necessarily a known of how to provide these services or how to provide this instruction. So there has been a lot of professional learning. I will echo what Ashley Eckleberry has said tonight. I am up until 1.30 every morning. I'm hopeful. But it'll get better. I absolutely love teaching remotely. Of all the jobs I've ever had, it is by far my favorite place that I've ever had, which I think is reflected in the fact that I'm willing to stay up that late. <laughs> but I also have a benefit that a lot of my colleagues don't. I have no children. I also have a husband who works odd hours sometimes. And so I don't have other people who are depending on me for their immediate needs on a frequent basis. That's not the case with all my colleagues. And as Ashley said tonight, not all teams work together well. Mine is a dream. I couldn't ask for better remote colleagues or in-person colleagues. There has been an exceptional amount of sharing there. But there are hiccups because we've randomly pulled people and put them together and called it a team. Anything else? Go ahead, hit me up. Yes, you know, you know it. Um, so I, I take that to heart, your comment that um, from NEA perspective, uh, in the eyes of teachers, the relationship with the board is not, is not as strong as maybe it once was. Um, and I, I think that that's because there was a lot of questions asked. And so from, from my perspective, um, I want to just make sure that I communicate 
from me, a single board member, I'm asking a lot of questions because I am seeking to understand. I don't know how to solve problems or how to direct um, or ask administrators to solve problems unless I understand what the problems are. So when I ask what's causing you to stay up to 1.30 in the morning, what is causing the additional workload, et cetera, et cetera, it's because I'm trying to figure it out because I only see things from my own foxhole. I want to give a shout out to the teachers that did communicate, wrote letters. The most impactful one for me was um, Aaron, uh, Rachel Shivers, who did a, sent us a video of how she had to upload essentially three different curriculums onto Canvas, one for Group A, one for Group B, and one for her, the remote kids. Wow, that was, now I could see. That was great. So from your perspective, is there something that the teachers are looking for from the board members so that we can make sure that we are communicating our support to the teachers who we know are working so dang hard to get this right? I would say validate that they are working hard. That is what they are not hearing. That is what they are not feeling. And again, this isn't coming from me. Knowing your personality over the last few years, I know that you're a questioner and you're, I, you're probably what, a three or an eight on an Enneagram? Mm -hmm. I got you. <laughs> um, but, and that's part of your personality. So I never, I, again, everyone's seeking to understand and asking questions. If we don't have questioners, we can't figure out what's going on. So please know, this doesn't come from a place of, ah, it's just one person. This is coming from a place of, after our last meeting, there were a significant amount of people who went back and watched the board meeting, if we look at the view numbers we had compared to previous board meetings, who when comments were made and kind of trickled down, people went back to watch and listen and verify, did this happen? And I think that's where the breakdown has happened, is feeling like, Whereas things can happen in a candid conversation sometimes with one person, but we don't catch it on film. When things are caught on film, it looks completely different. And knowing that I'm being recorded on Zoom all day, I know that at any point in time, a parent can always go back and rewatch and see Mrs. MG did this today. She said this to this particular kid. And now that I could be called into question for my actions, my tone of voice, you know, how this breakout room looked, because again, breakout rooms are, are there. And, and I think that's it, is that I have a relationship with this board and I know your hearts from working with you and being at conferences over the years and getting to know you on a different level. That's not the case for every educator and every educator filtered that in a different way. So, um, they're hearing essentially they're doing everything that they can, but it's not being validated. And I think that's what they're needing to hear. There's an, uh, there's a, a social and emotional book. Um, and I'm trying to remember who wrote it, but I can't think of the author, but the title is have you filled a bucket? And it talks about every, every person has an emotional bucket and we take this emotional bucket and you have bucket fillers, and bucket dippers. And I know this sounds so juvenile to like talk about bucket dipping, but um, within that, uh, we look for different ways to fill people's buckets as educators. And so we're constantly looking to be a bucket filler, but we each have our own bucket. And when your bucket is consistently being dipped into, but the replenishment is not happening, that's where the issues are happening. And I think right now what we're having not I think, I know. I know right now what we're having are empty emotional buckets from the exhaustion that's happened at this point. Nobody could anticipate the exhaustion that we're all going through. On your end as board members, administrators, 
teaching staff. I mean, nobody, nobody can anticipate this. Parents, I'm sorry, parents. There's just no way that any of us could know. And I think we have a significant amount of empty emotional buckets right now that aren't necessarily getting filled. Because it's not, what we're seeing is Canvas assignments are there, or I now see this assignment's posted, but what's not being seen is the classroom teacher was up till 1.30, or the turnaround time isn't very fast on the grading. Well, there's been, you know, 120 assignments turned in today. So, and I, and I think that's just it, is, and it's not simply remote. I mean, that's everybody. I mean, hybrid's going through the same thing. They have a ton of assignments being turned in daily too. Double Zooms. I can't even conceptualize that, what they're going through, teaching in person and having a Zoom running at the same time. Running a Zoom alone is a lot. So any others? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will. <laughs> All right, um, board comments. And we'll start with Brandy. Um, I just have a quick one. It's very nice to see you back and recovered. And um, I'm sorry that we are missing another board member tonight, but hopefully we'll all get back and stay healthy and work hard to make some decisions that really will make a positive impact um, on our district. That's all I have. Thank you. Kurt. I have no comments. Okay. I just wanted to give a shout out um, to the Facebook group that Aaron mentioned, the amazing teachers Facebook page that Tricia Dunning and Amy Hageman have started. 100 teachers have posted wish lists and things that they need to make their classroom somehow more enhanced than it already is. Um, and I really have enjoyed seeing the happy faces as teachers have gotten the gifts and, and have been appreciative of how many community members have, have dug in to help um, do things to give blessings to those teachers. So I just appreciate everybody for doing that and for continuing that effort. And then I was just gonna echo, <laughs> um, I think a lot of us have been in various stages of quarantine over the last couple weeks, my family included. Um, my son's been sick, actually left out, didn't get COVID, um, but he's been really sick. And it's a reminder that cold and flu season are upon us. Um, and we're gonna have more and more kids out for other types of illnesses. And with the 72 hour rule, they're gonna be missing more and more school. We're gonna have more and more kids absent. I've had to tell my kids so many times this week to not do school, I feel really weird to be a school board member <laughs> because he needs to rest and get better. And so the kids they are really stressed. Um, hybrid just puts that much more on them. And then when they're gone, they have this constant fear of being behind and, and never being able to get out of that hole. So if we're gonna have to really be cognizant of that and the number of kids we're gonna have out as we're looking through all of these options and plans, because if we do resort or revert to more in-class time, we're gonna still have to have online resources for all the kids who are out. So still posting things to Canvas and still keeping up that discipline, because I think we're gonna find as we hit November, December, and January, that the numbers could get really high. Um, and it's stressful on families, and so I totally understand for everyone who's been in quarantine, I just did it for a week. Um, it's just additional stress, and so get your flu shot. Thank you. Daryl. I was just going to tell everybody to get a flu shot, but Cherry said it, so <laughs> I'm done. I got one yesterday, so. Um, I want to thank you to our community members who spoke tonight the preparation, thank you. And thanks for sticking in here. I know these are long meetings, especially when you don't come here all the time, you don't know the flow of them. It's kind of weird sometimes, I get it. Um, Cause before we were on this board, we sat out there in the audience for like a year. A so year. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Kurt. So I, I appreciate everybody who spoke from the heart. Um, the parents and the and the families who have continued to email us and seek solutions. And I, I really liked um, how Aaron Fackler talked about um, that people want to communicate, they want two-way communication and they want to help in the solutions. Um, and I think that that's key. Um, I also want to deeply thank our teachers who I think are rocking it. And Aaron left, thankfully, I'm glad she left to go get some rest. Um, Aaron Meyer Gambrell, um, but I, I tell you what, the t my kids' teachers are just on it. 
and I'm so impressed looking at the Canvas pages week after week, how they've improved. Um, uh, my daughter couldn't log on to Zoom this morning. The teacher immediately emailed. I don't know how they're keeping up. And it's really amazing. And so I think that that is um, uh, just a, a testament to what professionals they are. I acknowledge teachers, you have a lot, a lot on your plate. So thank you so much for continuing to roll with the punches. Because as Aaron stated, there aren't necessarily good options on, on either side. I was particularly interested in Ashley Eckleberry's comments tonight um, as, uh, as one of our teachers of the year. And um, I can feel that there is a lot of um, just pain trying to figure this out. So that was uh, great that we heard from her, her tonight. Um, and reminder to anybody that's listening that um, all of us up here have kids that are in the district or were in the district. So we're experiencing this from both sides. And we will continue to find, to seek the best possible solutions. Okay. Um, it's nice to be back tonight. Tonight, um, it's nice to be back in person. I really appreciate the work that, that you guys did and um, the administrators, or really Dr. Wade, um, did with uh, Gary from KASB for that work session. I'm sorry, I couldn't be here in person, but even honestly from bed, it was um, a great conversation to listen to and I feel like it was a really helpful conversation for us. Um, speaking again, just from the heart with it, um, I think you guys knew well, I think you knew I had been tested, but I, I, we were a positive family. Um, my husband and I both had COVID and today was my first day back at work. Um, and that did mean that both of our kids have been home. Um, they're hybrid kids and they've missed two, two weeks of in-person instruction. And um, I kind of went back and forth about whether or not I wanted to say anything about how our teachers did because I feel bad um, singling them out for how wonderful they have been to my family during this time period because I know that there are teachers across every school all across the district that would have done and have done the same or comparable or, or whatever for their students. Um, I have a middle schooler and a high schooler and especially my middle schooler, the, the work that our, my teachers, our teachers did to keep her tied in, to allow her to stay connected to her peers and to her classes and to her schoolwork, just couldn't have been better. I couldn't have asked for anything more from them with being um, accessible and supportive of her, especially when um, Scott and I were in the bedroom for two weeks and my kids were in the rest of the house and really having to do it on their own so that they could come back to school tomorrow um, without having to isolate longer. Um, just because I know some of you guys don't have middle school or high schoolers um, to round things back out. One of the things that was wonderful for us that happened that just is another above and beyond um, I think we know that the, most of us know that the iPad cases have come in now for the secondary students. We had one delivered to our house from our teacher so that she could then do her schoolwork with a keyboard. And I couldn't tell you how many times from the doorway I heard from her, it sure is nice to have a keyboard to work on now so that I can, it's so much easier to do my schoolwork. So again, um, I'm, I'm very thankful for, for our, our specific teachers, but again, I also know that, that they are not alone, um, that, that they're doing so much above and beyond every day, and it is appreciated very much. Um, and it hasn't been fun, and I'm super glad that the kids get to go back to school tomorrow. Well. No, yeah, I'm super glad my high, my middle schooler is super glad and my high schooler is much more along the lines of Dill and he has enjoyed the different sleep schedule of the last two weeks. And he has a rude awakening tomorrow morning that will happen. 
And I think that was my, my only comment tonight was to just share that thanks and appreciation for them. Which closes out our board comments and moves us to um, Tracy and Vicki for middle school athletic and activity annual report. They had that report in the board packet for us to review. And I think are here this evening if there's questions or anything you guys wanted to highlight. Thanks for having us. We know that it's a, a very full night tonight. Um, this is something that we've been doing since 2005, uh, the two middle schools. And during this time, it was, um, it's evolved with more participation, more activities. Um, some of you have been on the board for a while. Um, these topics, the, the, um, the different events change. Some of that is due to student influence or staff influence. If we have fluctuation of staff or students, so the different clubs and activities do vary um, from year to year. Um, uh, Tracy, I'll let you speak to some of the different maybe grants that you have with some of the different offerings that you have. Um, and then I, I think we'll just kind of take questions from there. Yeah, um, before I dive into that, I have to say that humor is the best medicine that we can have right now. And I wanted to say to the Hagemeisters, I've always known they were a positive family. <laughs> And I'm not sure if that's Eric or Jardine over there, but no, I think it's Eric. But anyway, um, no, we were fortunate enough. This is our fifth year of a community's uh, or a 21st century grant that was written in um, cooperation with Boys and Girls Club. And uh, it's allowed us to do a lot of different things after school. Um, we've had a bowling team the last four years. don't think we're probably going to have that this year due to COVID and the uh, proprietor here in town, not sure, but I haven't talked to him, but, um, but some of our after school clubs that have been funded that in the past weren't art club, writing club, some of those things that we've been fortunate to have. But, uh, I wanted to address just the whole spring, um, um, cancellation of all of our, and you can see on the chart there, um, there were, were no numbers and that continued into this fall. Um, not that we had to cancel everything, but our numbers in cross country were way, way, we were 20 down this year. Volleyball, we couldn't really fill two seventh grade squads. Um, we were able to, though. Um, didn't really have to cut it in eighth grade, which is a good thing, I think, in some perspectives. But um, And football was down a little bit, but not very much. Um, we're getting ready to uh, attempt to have wrestling. Keisha put out some guidelines there. It's going to change a lot. We'll just have duos. We won't have, uh, you know, tries or quads. Um, one team will wrestle on this mat while, uh, or one one uh, weight class. This class, this mat's being cleaned, and then we'll just alternate back and forth. So it's it's going to be a long evening. But um, David asked me to touch on that. I know Brad and David have been talking um, with their Centennial Mud League um, counterparts about that season. And they're, they're meeting with Mike Marsh this Friday yeah. as well, just to make we, sure that we're being consistent across our schools. Yeah, we start girls um, basketball tryouts next week, I think. Volleyball wrapped up last week. So, um, you know, this, this report basically, it changes a little bit from year to year. Our narratives are hard to change sometimes, um, just depending on the fluctuation. Um, the sad thing is our music programs, we're not allowed to do the concerts this year. I mean, I think the band kids, have, they just got the, the coverings for some of their instruments so they can actually start playing. Um, that's just sad. Um, the after school band, after school choir, we're not running those. We're, we're, we're running a few after school um, clubs this year. I know we have Stuco and Kay's firing up. We have a green club that did some work outside the building last night, but um, just fortunate, I think, that we have um, so many opportunities. One of the things that I talk to kids about first day of school is to get involved in something, get, in, get involved in something after school. It was hard to sell this year, mm -hmm. um, but uh, normally it's not. We, we have good um, high numbers in, in activities after school. I would say that our kids are very appreciative and our parents um, have been very appreciative of any of the activities. I mean, the girls volleyball parents were like, we weren't sure when we started this if we were going to finish a season, you know, the first yeah. two or three weeks, we weren't sure either. So being able to complete that, looking ahead, um, you know, our extended day learning is back, our K's club, you know, we're looking to how to spread, we need to select places where we spread them out. Um, but 
but we're starting to cycle back. And, and the kids talk about how that, that feels better too. It feels a little bit more normal, normal, whatever normal is. You know? Yes, as normal as we can get. So questions? Any questions? Daryl? Somebody's gotta ask something. The only thing I, I find or I see unique is the difference in your instrumental music and vocal music. We share the same teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. And yet, I don't know, AMS is really high in instrument. Uh, I mean, EMS is high, but it's not as high. But EMS is really high in vocal, and AMS is, is much lower. Any thought? Well, the I can touch on the instrumental. Um, that's combined orchestra and band together in one sum. And Anthony's orchestra is through the roof. Um, and our band is through the roof. Um, I think mm -hmm. Anthony's comparable, though, in band. But that, that's what you see the numbers there for the difference in um, instrumental vocal music. Ours fluctuates from year to year, too. It just seems like the kids, we've changed music teachers, I think, four times in the last seven years that I've, or eight years, just my eighth year. Um, not by choice. I mean, we would have kept them. We just they moved on. We love them all. <laughs> one of them started a grad program at Creighton University, and one moved to Topeka. And so, I'm not sure what um, what the differences are there. Okay. I think I would just extend again our thanks to the teachers who are doing the extra work that's involved in coaching or sponsoring the student activities. I mean, again, I can say. Emily has been able to participate in Stuco from home, and that's an option that's yeah. available for the remote students as well. So that, you know, one thing that's missing for for some of those remote students is that connection to the school. So the fact that they're able to participate in some of the same activities with their peers that they're not seeing um, mm -hmm. is is appreciated. And knowing that that our coaches are very probably most often teachers. Mm -hmm. as well um, and again having a volleyball kid we had our postseason volleyball party last night and that was the first time Emily got to leave the house mm -hmm. and um, we all did celebrate the fact that nobody thought that the season would we were grateful yeah. for one game <laughs> right you know we were we went to that first game because we thought this might be the one and only mm -hmm. and the coaches and all of the staff and the kids we're all responsible in doing what they needed to do in order, in order for that season to be successful and also help us and help the coaches learn, okay, that was successful. So how do we move that forward to the next activity or to the next thing? And how do we make the next season better? Mm -hmm. um, they were the, the guinea pigs who, who worked through that. So again, very thankful to the coaches who also are teachers for the time that they continue to put into that and the passion that they have to have for it in order to um, lose even more of their time to do that. So thank you guys for that good report. Thank you for all the activities that you're doing. And unless there's anything else you want to share with us, I'd like to send you home. Yeah. <laughs> I will you. give our coaches kudos um, on following through with the protocols that were put into place, mm -hmm. temperature checks and filling out every day. They've got the line of students that come in for, for all the Teachers. activities. But I wanna give our kids kudos too for the mass. And that's one thing through all this that they, they've, they've been awesome. And I tell them that at lunch, you're awesome. You have awesomeness. And we've had to get onto one or two kids, that's it about the mass thing. And, and, and that's doing... making a difference in our club's activities. The, the reason that you're even able to have these other conversations and that's our parents and our community. So that's that's yeah. that's good job on our on everyone, you know, yes. working on that, so. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Good rest of the week. Um, Lee facility update. Matt Davis and Erica, I think is, Erica is here. If she wants to come to the table, she may, but obviously you don't have to. And Dr. Wade or whoever else needs to update us. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, just wanted to brief you all on, uh, on the updates that uh, for the, uh, um, citizen comment that was made back in July. So uh, in the weeks since the, the public comment was made, we, 
we've had uh, various meetings, both in person and Zoom, um, with the concerned group uh, to gather some input and develop a clear path to resolution uh, for all the all the things that came up. Uh, Erica was was great. She developed a uh, a step process for reporting any custodial issues within the building so that we can uh, quickly resolve those and and uh, and prevent any future issues. Um, custodial maps were were shared with the entire team and all the team members know their assignments um, and the proper contact sequence for resolving any issues. So um, that being said, we we have two vacancies there right now uh, at Lee. Um, we're hoping to have one our, our daytime position filled next week. Um, and then we we've also got a, a night position that's open there. We're we're at eight positions total right now that we don't have filled throughout the district. So our night crew will cover that until until we can find a good replacement. Uh, as far as the the maintenance issues with the with the HVAC system, um, we had it in the budget this year uh, or last year to uh, to get the system tested and balanced and, and try to come to uh, some sort of a conclusion as to why we were experiencing the humidity and the the heat issues. Um, so that was done this summer and the humidity sensors were installed um, in various sections of the building so we can monitor that humidity. Um, while it solved the global issues with the building, it did not solve the third floor issues. So we're, we're still having some issues with the third floor. Um, humidity in hot rooms, obviously the being on the third floor um, does does cause your heat and your humi humidity uh, just they migrate up there. Um, so we check the vapor barrier, the vapor barrier seems to be um, in good condition. Um, so we consulted with our engineer we uh, had meetings with our engineer and our contractors uh, to come up with a resolution for that. Um, the systems that were in place right now uh, or that are in place right now are five ton units. And so they're, they're significantly sized. Um, to put it in perspective, your, your home unit would on a 1600 square foot home would be about a three ton unit. So they were sized for the heat load um, of having 30 bodies in there. So obviously your, your students who are, you know, they're about half the size of, of, uh, of a full person or a, a grown up. Uh, so um, that, that does obviously uh, affect the heat load, your calculations and that type of thing. So um, what we came up with, our engineer designed um, new systems. So what we'll do is we have two classrooms that are on the far west side on the third floor that we're going to try first. Um, and we're going to put a two ton unit in there instead of a five ton. So that way the units will run longer to dry that, help dry those areas out. And if that works uh, on those two classrooms, then we'll go ahead and do the rest of the third floor and try to get that all under control. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, a small window of time throughout the year where the humidity is the worst. Um, so we may not know until next summer how this is going to affect, uh, if it's actually going to solve the issues or not. So um, I'll stand for any questions, I guess, if you have any. Just thanks for addressing it. Go for it. Yeah. Thank you for I, and I was concerned about how this would affect ventilation and COVID conditions, that sort of thing. So um, I would thank you, Erica, for developing the step process for your for your staff. I think that that's great. That's mm -hmm. good communication. Um, and and then I think it'd be interesting to get an update after we have the right. summer months. Let's Absolutely. See if it's yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. And I, 
I do think maybe just to touch back again that, that this is a good example of that process of a community of people who are concerned about something coming forward, um, bringing it through their comments and bringing it to our attention or, or bringing it forward and then giving us the time to, to work through it and, and then you guys coming back to us and letting us know how you've done that. And that's, that's what we like to do. So thank right. you for coming back and giving us that update. And hopefully come next summer, we'll have good news. Yeah. Thanks. If I could, I'd like to make another comment along those lines though. And that would be as opposed to starting with the board with their concerns in the future, I believe people need to go to the building administrator, go to the building and grounds, start there, give them an opportunity. If they can't resolve it, bring it to me or Eric before coming to the board. That would be the appropriate channel to take. Yes. All right. Eric, would you like to give us an update from the September 20th enrollment report? That's I'm I'm tired and I have a headache, Court Kurt, but I'm still reading my agenda. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I've given you guys hard copy handouts. Diane has extra for anybody in the audience. To get our count numbers for September 21st, um, as, as I showed you guys early in the year with the preliminary enrollment numbers, we knew we were gonna be down um, to what level. And we've lost some kids, we've added some kids, we've moved some kids. We've, we've done a lot of action between the start of school and now. Um, but what you'll see the biggest difference is I have on the top chart is September 20th from last year. That's count day. That's our default. That's, that's where we base everything off of. And this year that would be September 21st, our numbers. And you'll see a significant difference in the elementary numbers. Um, if you look at the class size numbers, um, a, a lot of people right from the start said, I'm not messing with it at all. We're going straight homeschool. And, and they went that capacity or they went to a different online school. Um, some of them transferred to private schools. Some of them transferred outside. It, buildings weren't offering or there were offering five days a week. And I, I understand that. I, I get that piece of it. But we're, we're down about 350 kids on the elementary side. We're up a few students on the secondary side, which... Um, outside of COVID and the, and the issues that go along with that, I want, I want to speak to that a little bit because I, I knew the elementary numbers were going to be down. I don't think that's any surprise. I think I've said that multiple times before we even came back in here. I wasn't expecting that many and just didn't know how many. But we've seen a trend in the last three years that hasn't been the trend for us as a district over the last 20. I mean, we what what we've seen the pretty much the last 10 years is strong elementary growth static at the secondary level and didn't matter how large the elementary numbers were it flattened out or even topped down um, when you got to middle school and high school over the last 3 years you've definitely seen a switch turn on the secondary which um for the preceding 2 years We've seen some increase at the elementary level and seeing that secondary level turn around at the same time. And now, even in the issue of COVID, where I, I know we have some flight away from the district because of that, but our numbers still go up. Um, I think that also goes to show, you know, people as as the kids get older to, to stick with the system and stick with where they're at, um, a lot more open. Also, the classes are a little harder to homeschool. Um, as far as content and being able to stay on top of that, I, I don't want to say home homeschool, no matter what it is easy. I mean, cause if you ever taught kindergarten, I, it's not easy. I mean, it might be ones and twos and reds and greens, but it is a lot more than that, no matter what capacity you're looking at. So, um, I was also expecting a pretty small or a smaller kindergarten number. Um, I thought a lot of the people on the fence, you know, there are young 
they're young five, do I, do I send them in, in this context? And I think a lot of those people said, no, I'll, I'll wait till they're six and we'll send them on that way. Um, so I'll, I'll be curious to see what that means next year. That that's one we're going to have to, I think, have some cushion, um, positions around the district that could be flexible on how many we need, um, probably need a few more, um, be ready to move people around if, if necessary next year. Um, as long as everything returns back to semi normal. So you see the total on the end, um, 64, five last year down to 61, 43. So right around a 300 student drop right, right around there, just a little bit more than that. Um, biggest difference was at the elementary school. You'll see, we went from classes in the, in the five hundreds all the way through to the mid, mid upper four hundreds. So you kind of see our trends that we go that way, but I wanted to note the middle school and the secondary, um, a lot of our planning and our projects, you know, as we move sixth grade in was based off data right before this turned around. Um, and you, that is what it is. Um, but I think it's going to be a, a issue as we move forward. If that pattern continues to grow in our community that we're hanging on to students longer than we traditionally had. Uh, oh, another reason on the, on the drop of the elementary that we were expecting, and it is COVID related, um, a lot of K-State um, graduate students, international students um, weren't able to come back and travel into the country. And one of those programs, if you guys remember uh, the Cabrat program, specifically with Saudi Arabia was about 40 to 50, mostly elementary age students. So we knew when that was coming back, that was gonna be an automatic down Anyway, so we, we've seen a lot of that drop um, come from our areas of K-State um, that people weren't, weren't coming back or weren't starting their graduate programs or doctoral programs with the uh, ones that have young families at that time. Generally, what we'd see is those, those families come in, they have younger students, and then um, as they finish their programs, then, then they go and they go back, um, they go on to work in whatever capacity professional field they are or their home country, and we start losing them. So we're retaining more of those. We hit triple digits in the middle schools. You see middle schools hit 1,000 1, kids if you combine them um, both together. Yeah, so there, there's a lot going on in there, but I just wanted to give you guys the kind of skinny on how the K-12 enrollment hits up um, along the way. And then I'll flip over to, if you flip over it, it'll be the other category. So that's our, that's our K-12. Um, forgot, I, I usually say that chart right there, that's tails in the seat. You know, the, those are physical kids that are actually there. When we get to count day, we also pull in some special education from the private schools, some homeschool families that are coming in for services. So you get a lot of extra numbers um, thrown in there, but they're not really there all the time. So that's a little different. So on the other, I'll show you the early learning or the preschool program. So on the left, I have 2019. On the right, I have 2020 and where we're at. And you'll see a lower number there. Part of that is we were expecting a lower number anyway. We, we were expecting a lower number of um, Non-qualifiers, um, usually we, ha we have our qualifiers for, you qualify for special education or you're qualifying in an at-risk category. Um, and then we have our peer models. So we were planning on having less peer models this year because we knew we were in a transition. We knew we were in Trinity moving into College Hills new facility. We were planning on Eugene Field transitioning in there while we work on Eugene Field. So it wasn't a year we expanded and tried to cap out our early learning numbers on purpose. But then even some of the peer models that we had um, lined out chose not to come um, to a school environment this year um, for, for a lot of reasons. But the ones that were qualified were able to come in. So if, if you qualified for a program, those were there. We did not reduce those numbers. I just wanna make sure people know our, the, the intention of our early learning program, the heart and soul of it is special education and our at-risk youth. And that did not suffer uh, along that end. Um, actually, I think Andy told me they had seven additional slots that we, they could still fill along the way. And the good thing about those is those numbers aren't necessarily due by September 20th. 
like everything else is because we can qualify them in multiple different programs you know the way the way they've blended the program together where it's head start um four-year-old at risk all, all the different early learning programs together gives us great amount of flexibility to qualify kids at different points of the year than just where they are on september 21st so we can still do some child buying we can still bring some more some more kids in that line but we're i think they said we're down to about seven slots um, that were available to bring in um, a good thing that happened this year is they removed the cap um, if you see r4 i know I, I i'm writing in a different language up there that's your at-risk four-year-olds. That's a funding program that we used to have capped out by the state. We used to have a number um, that we needed to be at, and I think it was 50. Is that right, Lou? I think 52, I think was our, yeah. And they were 0.5 FTE. Um, so you'll see that we have a number of 81 up there. One thing the state did, um, KSDE, with a different revenue source is they basically removed the cap. So before we even had trouble getting to our cap, but this year we're gonna be way over the cap. Last year, we'd have only got funded for 52 of those kids at 0.5 FTE. This year, we should get funded 81 of those students. So we're basically gonna get funded on the students that are there, not just the limited amount that we're qualifying before. So I thank KSDE. Um, really grateful for that opportunity to invest in early learning. Thank the legislature for providing some of that as well, some of that support along the way. And so I, I see some opportunities there that we'll, we'll make up the funding issues with the numbers, um, with what we gain from the state. And you also see, I wanted to notice too, the KPAT or parents as teachers number going down significantly from 132 to 77. And it was the same thing about um, those went all virtual and a lot of the families were like, uh, that's a different thing. That's not what we really signed up for. So we're out and they're still doing the best they can to kind of provide those services. But the things like the play groups and some of those areas that they would reach out and branch out are being done differently. And, and I think that affects their numbers. So, uh, so we got that going on the early learning side. So just for your interpretation, this is our preschool three-year-olds um, that come in, mostly special education um, right in there. Could be some peer models, but mostly special education. Same thing, P4, um, special education and peer models. R3 would be our at-risk three-year-olds and our at-risk four-year-olds. And you'll see the total at each of the buildings. You'll see there's a new category that was actually not there in 2019, which is remote. So something Elizabeth and her team did early is they put a branch out there to see, hey, if we do have a remote option for our early learning community, who's wanting to do that? Um, they, they've been able to do on site and they follow health regulation guidelines. They follow a different standard. So they're, they're not on the two day hybrid, um, but they put the remote option for who families that were wanting that and they had 32 families take them up on that so they were able to get a teacher put in for remote and some supports put into place for that to try and connect those families in there otherwise we'd be 32 less than that so um going down 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 to the others i, I don't know a way to put this but the others but you got your job core you got your manhattan virtual academy um, are kind of our other programs. So you'll see the 2019 on the top um, Job Corps um, that, we, that we run the completion program out at Job Corps. Dr. Christian, um, the principal for that program, they do a really nice job trying to finish kids up. And we went from 112 to 92. I don't, that's no surprise. 112 was actually a pretty high number for us on that end. Um, the other thing with Job Corps is they get three count days, not one count day. So they get a count day in September, we get a count day in November, we get a count day in April, and we get the highest of the three count days is what we can attribute that because they have so much in and out. Um, actually, the November count day, part of me, I don't even count that one because it's too close to Thanksgiving. 
where they go home on extended break. That's never our high count, but sometimes April's our high count, but a lot of times September's are a high count. And those kids are actually double funded if um, um, through KSD's formula. And then we have Manhattan Virtual Academy, which we were basically able to cap out those wherever we wanted those numbers this year. So you'll see a growth in MVA um, from the full time from a 166 last year to a 224. And you'll see um, for the starting at sixth grade, um, you'll see where those numbers went out. Um, something I always ask Brooke to do for me, and she does a great job keeping track of her data, is who are the MVA, full time MVA students that are living within the 383 boundaries? So you'll see that starting in eighth grade, nine, two, so four, 49 people within our community have chosen that, that route um, to go virtual school. This is not remote school. This is the virtual school, the one we run a little differently than, than we do the remote side. And then she also has some contract or private pay. Um, th this would be picking up some schools, you know, some smaller schools that don't have, I'll, I'll just throw out an example. I don't even know what the class is, but it could be physics. And maybe they only have two kids in their school that are interested in taking physics. Well, you can't, they don't get a teacher to teach an hour of physics for only two kids. So Brooke will take private pay from, and those districts will contract with her. Um, sometimes it's just a parent um, wanting to take an extra class and that they take their full load. Um, they take their full load at Manhattan High. They'll, they'll take all their hours, but they'll say, I wanna take this too. And maybe that's to get to something else down the road. Could be doubling up on a math to try and get the Calc 2 path. Um, could, could be a lot of reasons why families want to do that, but um, that's an option that Brooke helps with. So she'll provide that, but th those are paid. So those are at cost. Um, we stopped doing part-time enrollment through MVA. If you guys remember, MVA is funded um, differently than our base aid per people. They're funded at $5,000. And a few years back, they changed the formula that um, if they were part-time at all, if they were under 1.0 FTE, they were prorated off a much lower number. I want to say is 800. And so basically we couldn't even cover costs if we allowed part-time students. Now we also have a lot of students from, um, a lot of Manhattan High students will take a class over there for an hour. And we, we set up a deal with Brooke. She covers a lot of those classes for the for those kids that maybe they can't get that class in their schedule. Um, or maybe, that yeah, they have an elective offer, but they want to take their English class and they'll, they'll do MBA those hours. So we've got a lot of options available to our kids. And that's where MBA comes into play on a lot of that. So I know I covered a lot of broad things but I'll be happy to take questions if you guys have anything for me. Yes, ma'am. Hold on. Somebody My else friend. can go first. You, I'm you tell go me first. which chart you want me to go to. I'm going first. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. On the main page. Main page. Just clarifying in my brain, um, the way that you've got our numbers this year, obviously that includes our remote students. Yes. And they are counted within the school that they typically would attend? No. Where maybe how, where are they counted? Maybe. Okay. The the way we handled the remote students is um we left them in their boundary school. Okay. So we uh, we didn't for for some of the family like I'll take Brandy's force okay. transfer family, you know, we had them in they're in Woodrow's district and we forced transfer them to Bluemont, but now they're a remote student. That student would be in Woodrow's numbers, not Bluemont's numbers. We, we put all the remote students back in their home building, home district their building. Their boundary building. In their boundary building. I've never found a good way to, Okay. I think the technical words homeschool is what you're supposed to say, but that has different connotations. Right. It's about it, everybody, so. So remote students are included, but they are counted within their boundary directed they're within their boundary location. building yes ma'am that was my question i think kristen mine's kind of a question or kind of a comment i happened to hear a story on npr on the way here tonight about how this is the situation of public schools across america before the headline makes it look like 
our district is somehow doing something different and losing kids that this is a very common phenomenon everywhere. They said they're estimating 15% drop in kindergarten nationwide this year. So I just wanted to reflect that. I don't know if you have any other comments, but I get to see that being the headline in the Mercury tomorrow night. And I just want everybody to know that this is the status quo in all public schools in the country right now. A lot of my peers, very, very much so. Um, it, it does seem in my mind, because I'm connected to small schools through large schools now, a um, little tougher and the bigger, the bigger the community is, I think the more impact they see, the more rural, the less impact, but it's still there. You know, I, I always remember, you know, back, back in my small 1A school days, three kids, three kids meant more than 300 kids here. I can almost tell you that. Um, so yeah, you're, you're, you're very correct, Kristen. Absolutely. Katrina, go so for it. Related question uh, on, on Kristen's. Obviously, if we've got a delta of 308, then that's 308 times. Lou, what's our base aid per pupil? Around 4,500. Okay. So if, that's, if that is the situation across the state, right, is there any chance for us to, <laughs> to say to the state, hey, this is an anomaly year? We still, this is not going to be a trend. Yeah. Because I would hate, I would imagine that if this is a trend across all districts, I don't want to lose that funding. Yeah. And I don't want the state legislature to say, oh, well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that. that that is a tremendous question and one I'm very happy to address. Something you need to remember as far as the state funding formula and how it works, um, you have different options. Um, you can use current year enrollment, past year enrollment, um, three year average enrollment. We can actually go back to our third, second prior year is what they call it, Lou. We can go back to the prior year, second prior year. Because we're a military um, connected community, we get that second prior year option to use as our budget number. So we can go back to our larger numbers. We, we can take that 6451 as our base number so we don't necessarily lose that. Where we lose it is on the weightings, because weightings are done from year to year. And by weightings, I mean transportation weighting. If you live more than two and a half miles away, you're transportation weighting. So when we're down those 300 kids, we lose the weights off those. If they're a free, free family, we lose the at-risk weighting. Um, if they're bilingual, we lose the ESOL bilingual weighting. Um, if they were going to take a CTE class, I got Dorst. He's probably working on that right now, I'm hoping. <laughs> Um, working on CTE numbers because when when you have a drop in the number of kids and what you can offer, we, we lose on the waiting. So I think something very valuable and it's conversations Lou's already put in the ear of people at KSDE, it'd be something as legislative sessions come up, a hold harmless on the waitings um, for districts that are fighting this because um, you're, you're talking about a lot of money um, that'll be right back in next year. And I, I think that's one of the difficulties that if you that if you have a feast this year and a famine, um, the other piece is for us, it's about staffing too, and just making sure we're properly staffed um, because that 6143 becomes part of our history now. So next year, it'll be our prior year. And the year after that, it'll be our preceding prior year. And then it'll be part of our three-year average. So it's going to take us down, which um, as long as we build back up, we'll be okay budget-wise, but, it, but it'll be those waitings. And those are things that go into our at-risk programs. So when our at-risk waiting goes down, as far as numbers go down, that limits what we put into those after-school programs that um, we're, we have to reduce what goes down into the buildings in those capacities, which is what's serving those at-risk populations. That's something I think the legislature's tried to protect that put those things into place. And it's something we're gonna be dealing with um, over the next year about how to how to overcome these waitings. I think we're in a good position to do that. We've put ourselves in a good position, ready to do that. And part of that is, I've talked about this before, we've been planning to open up a new school building. So we've had a buffer built in in the budget that needs to get taken up. But next year we open that building. And so that buffer goes away so, so to be clear though the conversations have been initiated with 
KSDE. It'd be initiating, but um, they're always saying administrators are always asking for money. I think it's meaningful when my board members talk to legislatures specifically. Um, if if we talk to KSDE about a hold harmless, they're probably going to say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We need the legislature to step in and say a hold harmless is going to be okay for a year because it, it is going to be this way uh, across the state. You're going to see a probably significant drop in numbers. I have a couple more questions, but I thought Kristen might have some. I was just going to ask if we've analyzed if the students that we've lost are have we analyzed who those students are, meaning are, are have we lost in those waiting areas or is it pretty even those students who qualify for those programs and those who don't, or have we just not gone to that type of work yet? I I just got my yeah. first set of part of the numbers today. So yeah, hard to tell. Um, I, I wanna say we lost a lot of at-risk families. And that, that would be my, one of my initial things is we, we lost a lot of people that were on free lunch mm -hmm. are, are in those groups and so want to shift over to the, the preschool. So that's a delta down of 124. And if I'm my math is correct, my subtra subtraction, I've got a lot of that practice lately, though, the third grader at home. <laughs> um, so what my what I don't understand is, does that mean that those are all open slots that we then have at the preschool level? I, I think I might have missed something there. Because you, you said only seven slots, but what, there's such a huge number difference. Well, like I said, we, we were planning on dropping that anyway because we knew we were going to be at limited capacity right. or we weren't expanding as much as we have been. I mean, you've, we've, we've seen that grow out and we've also grown the number of full day programs to half day programs. And, and that's continued on as well. And that's one reason why that number is lower too. Um, the seven slots are the qualifiers for um, the Head Start grant. Um, for your at risk, move remove their cap, but those different funding sources that we have are usually tied to slots. Kind of like I explained with four year old at risk, we used to be at 54 slots and now they took that off. Well, the other programs still have slots that we can account for and receive funding for. So we have seven left of those that are able to come in and still be funded. Does that make so sense? How many are there? Are there still other slots though? for other preschoolers in this community to fill. That's, that's what I'm not understanding. We're down 124, so are those just family members that didn't sign their kids up, or are we capped somehow? I don't believe we're capped. Now, th this would be more of a Andy Elizabeth question sure. than it is for me, because I don't monitor their numbers for funding, yeah. but, I, but I believe they have space for some of those people if they wanted to apply into those programs. I guess it just surprised me because child care is at such a premium in, yeah. in this community. And I, let me rephrase, I understand that this is not child care, but this is pre, this is preschool for three and four year olds. Um, and it, it surprised me that we're down so many mm -hmm. there. And I, I just, I wonder how much of that is due to the pandemic versus is there, are there communication? I think it's a little of both. I think it's a little above. We were planning to be cut back smaller because we're going to be housed in one building for a little bit until Eugene Field gets finished. So that that was partially planned. It wasn't planned to go that low. I want to say probably about 50 is where they were shooting for. 50 more, right around 400, I think, is where they were try, trying to get. But a lot of the, like I said, peer model families kind of said, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Okay. Um, also, a lot of those families, that, that's where the fees come in. So there are fees to be able to come in in an area of COVID. Maybe I don't want to put those fees down to hold my slot. I can get another spot that's a little more guaranteed. I, I, I think we we're probably a little riskier investment than in some places. I, I mean, I don't think that's unfair to say, because if, if, if you were betting in uncertainties, we didn't have a lot of certainties, still don't. Any other questions for Eric? Brandy. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that um, Kristen said, and uh, for the next board meeting, can we get some information about the demographics of the 300 or so that we did this? And also, can we find out where they went? You know, they in 
areas around here? Did they leave the state? What's just kind of knowing the situation? Is there any way to find that out? I'll do the best I can. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. We, we, sometimes we're limited on information, what, what we get, but we, we do get some information on where, where everybody went. So we should be able to see transferred to private school, transferred to another district, um, another surrounding district. Sometimes that's because they moved, sometimes it's because they didn't and they chose that. So I think that's, yeah, that's reasonable, Brandy. I'll, I'll do the best I can to come up with what we got. Okay. Thank you. I think the bring it home comment that I would make about this is that we're talking about funding and full-time enrollment and we're talking about it in dollars, but in reality, we all know that, that those dollars equate people and services that we're talking about our ability to have the right number of teachers, have the right number of paras and support staff and be able to pay those people what, what we need to pay them in order to um, recognize their work, acknowledge their work and um, provide the services that we need to provide to students and families. So although we talk about it in dollars and funding, what we're really, where it, when you dig down into it, we're talking about people and programs. So thank you for taking the time to go through that with us. All right, written reports. Um, we've got the professional development annual report. Paula is here. Are there any questions for her? That was in our board packet. Seeing none, thank you, Paula. The summer program summary, which is also Paula and Andrea. Any questions for them? Okay. The title programs annual report. The at risk programs annual report with blue. And the maintenance cost athletic fields annual report from Matt. All right. They're all here, but they are also great reports that were pretty detailed in the packet. So Thank you. We took the time to read those and we appreciate the work that went into them, which takes us to new business. We've got a list that should hopefully move through pretty quick. The first one is the Lexia core five reading program purchase for Lee elementary and Erica's here and Kurt has a motion. I think I move to get final approval for the purchase of a three year subscription for Lee elementary to Lexia core five reading program, unlimited student licenses, in the amount of $21,055. Motion from Kurt and a second from Kristen. No, I had a question. Oh, a question from Kristen. Kristen, sorry. Um, I don't know if this is an Erica question or a Paula question. I was just curious why this one school is getting a software package that I know that other schools have had in the past. I don't know if it's just a Lee school request or if the other schools didn't want it or, or why, how we got here. And this can be quick. <laughs> So Lee School has used this program. It's been part of our curriculum protocol at Lee for several years now. We were in a situation this year where we weren't sure if we were going to have the funding to do it, but as it turns out, we have some at-risk funding, and this is a very appropriate use of at-risk funding. Our at-risk students deserve to have an opportunity like this, especially right now where we're in hybrid. Kids can work on this at home on their remote days. So we're just really excited about how great this program is going to be, but it's also used in conjunction with all of the other, the, the district curriculums that we already use for all of our students, which are excellent as well. So does that help? What, was this part of your reading roadmap before? No? It, it wasn't specifically part of that. Um, okay. I'm not even exactly sure which, which pot of funds it was purchased out of in the past, because that would have been prior to my time as principal. Lexi is a, was one of the big slots on KRR when it first first came out, so that's why I asked that question. I just knew other schools had had it. My kids did Lexi at Woodrow, so I just didn't mm -hmm. know if other schools chose to drop it or how we ended up with just Lee having it. That was just my question. I don't know that just Lee has it. I think that Lee is just coming. Just, it's okay. just coming Maybe. time for them to cycle through yep. versus it, it being a district-wide okay. purchase. I didn't know. Yep. Is that? Yeah. Okay. 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 Katrina, did you have a question or a second? All right, so there is a, a motion from Kurt and a second from Katrina. All in favor? All right, motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Erica. All right, I don't have, 
I don't know that I have the right number, so I'm going to count on you guys for this one. The amended guaranteed maximum price for Dwight D. Eisenhower Middle School, which I believe came th the corrected number or the corrected information came today. The number was correct. The account lines were different. Numbers is the same. Okay. So if anybody has a motion as you scroll to I maybe, got it. Kurt, go for it. I move to your final approval for the amended GMP for Eisenhower Middle School for the requested changes listed in the PCCO number 003 from account Gordon in the amount of 466,501. Okay, motion from Kurt and a second from Daryl. Are there any questions? We'll call the vote. All in favor? Motion carries 6-0. And the amended guaranteed maximum price for Susan B. Anthony Middle School. Kristen. I move to give final approval for the amended GMP for Anthony for the requested changes listed in PCCO's number 003 to number 004 for Macau Gordon in the amount of 491,531. Okay, motion from Kristen and a second from Katrina. Any questions? All in favor? Motion carries 6 0. The amended guaranteed maximum price for phase one, Frank Bergman Elementary. Katrina. I move to get final approval for the amended GMP for the listed RFC for Bergman Elementary to BHS construction for 22,703. Okay, motion from Katrina, a second from Daryl. All in favor? Motion carries 6 0. Please jump in if you have questions or comments. I'm going to keep us moving. The card access and gateways purchase for Oliver Brown. Katrina. I move to give final approval for the proposal to add or change existing door access and add gateways for NDE hardware in the amount of 115,960 for Oliver Brown Elementary from CBS Door and Hardware LLC. Okay, motion from Katrina. Is there a second from Kristen? All in favor with the hand. Motion carries 6-0. All right, let's, there's the voice. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Library casework and furniture upgrades at Marlette and Woodrow Wilson Elementary Schools. Kurt. Yeah. I'm moving to give final approval to the purchase of an installation of new library shelving for the Marlette Elementary Library and a new circulation desk for the Woodrow Wilson Elementary Library from Tesco Industries of Belleville, Texas in the amount of $45,010. Okay. Motion from Kurt. Second from Katrina. All in favor? Motion carries 6-0. Maintenance tractor purchase. Matt had that in the packet. Katrina? I move to get final approval for the purchase of a John Deere 5075E tractor in the amount of $54,042 from Deere & Company of Cary, North Carolina through the state of Kansas lawn equipment contract number 44069. PG 18 CG 22. All right, motion from Katrina and a second from Daryl. All in favor? Motion carries 6 0. And pickup truck purchase for maintenance department. Motion, or go for it, Kristen. I move to get final approval for the purchase of two new maintenance pickup trucks from National Auto Fleet Group of Watsonville, California, in the amount of 71969 Okay. Motion from Kristen, second from Katrina. All in favor? Motion carries 6-0. Matt, you're still back there. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for the information in that report. And just to maybe make note, those vehicles that we're talking about replacing are in the 20-year range. Mm -hmm. So they have certainly been well used. And um, it's time to make sure that we have equipment that's functional for the staff. So thank you. The facility use fee review, Katrina. I move to accept on first reading the proposal for no increase in facility use fees for fiscal year 21. And Kristen, second. Okay, all in favor? Motion carries 6-0. There will be no increase for facility use fees this year, which carries us through, I believe, all of the new business and brings us to old business, which is a reopening plan update from Dr. Wade. This is the last item on our agenda. I'm happy to carry through, or would we like a short break? Can we say five to 10 minutes? 
Five minutes. Okay, let's take a five minute break. Thank you.
agenda now. Thank you guys for that quick break and for coming back quickly, which takes us to our one item of old business, which is a reopening plan update from Dr. Wade. Okay, I'd like to start with a reminder that this is an information item. And there's not any action expected from the board tonight other than your involvement and the discussion that we need to have in order to make informed decisions moving forward that we know, you know, as a district, we've been consistent that we try to balance benefits and risk, looking at, at safety and educational needs and how to balance those out with the metrics that we've got, all the different factors and, and how complicated it is, but we do have to keep moving forward. And we've got 19 slides, just so you can kind of pace as we go through. We've got 19 slides that we want to go through with you. We have been vetting this through different groups. We went to cabinet, which is our, our district level administrators Monday. Yesterday was district administrative team, all the administrators, all the directors, principals from the district. Uh, also our medical advisory last night. Then today's the board. Uh, tomorrow, Eric will be going over this with labor management. And this, is, this isn't this is in any particular order other than just when these meetings occur on the calendar, that there's always going to be one group that gets information before others, uh, unless we just have a huge joint meeting. Uh, so that's kind of how this is, has, has flowed. Then also we'll get the information as we've done in the past out to uh, families and staff. So they, they are familiar with what we're talking about. But again, it's not an action item tonight. It's uh, looking at some decision-making points. What do we do moving forward so that we can have a date in mind that's a target that we move toward, the steps that we can take toward that, knowing, kind of like Eric did earlier in the meeting about just looking around about nod yes, nod no. What, what are the questions, concerns that the board has? From the uh, about the work that we're doing, and we're going to start with kind of the the next slide is the the past three weeks that you will call it the sep September 16th meeting. Seems like a long time ago, but at that meeting, that's when the board uh, did vote to have the October 22nd date that hybrid goes through October 22nd, and that gave some stability to. Uh, what we're doing as a district for a while until then. Uh, then we had the September 23rd board work session at that. The board identified uh, some advantages, disadvantages of the hybrid learning, and then desired outcomes. And we've kept those desired outcomes in mind as we were, we were working on these slides. Just a couple of them that I wanted to, to touch on would be, you know, the continuing the focus on safety and education. I mentioned that earlier decreasing the stress for students, parents, and staff. That came up a couple different ways during that, that work session. To examine which students are most at risk and then to take actions to address their needs. Uh, work has been occurring in that area. And then also, and this would be a, a pretty good part of tonight, would be engaging in the planning for a return to full-time face-to-face instruction in schools. And kept that in mind as, as we worked on this. That, since that September 23rd meeting, we did get the survey results, which we're going to go over. Our medical advisory group, as Aaron mentioned earlier, it's been meeting weekly. Uh, and then uh, instructional delivery options, we've been discussing those uh, based on what the survey results show, what the medical advisory group has advised us in the conversations we've had with them and looking at the, the gating metrics, which again, are, that's going to be covered tonight as well. So we've got quite a bit that's occurred the last three weeks we're gonna go over with you. Next up is survey results and Andrea is going to walk us through what we heard from the parent survey in English and Spanish. Yeah, so we um, did generate a survey after our September 16th meeting and send it out sent it out to both staff and families to fill out and give us feedback. Um, we got a, a good chunk as far as a response. Um, I think 2171 is our total between both um, our English and Spanish survey responses and 670 for our staff responses. Um, and we also, so we gave parents the opportunity if you didn't see it, so teachers and parents the opportunity to get kind of give us some 
quantitative feedback, but also allowed the opportunity to give some constructive feedback as well. So a lot of great ideas, a lot of good perspectives were shared, which we always appreciate. From our family survey, some of the highlights going over the comfort level with continuing our hybrid level or a hybrid schedule as is that Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, group A, group B, the average number was 3.43 out of five. Comfort level with changing, one of those options that was discussed was maybe going to a Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday um, for groups, and that came back as a 1.76 out of five, so not as high. For our secondary students, looking at the option of going to a non-block schedule, parents showed us that was a 3.38 out of five. And then asking parents how comfortable they felt supporting their students on the remote learning days was a 2.45 out of five. One of the questions as we look at going back to more days on site, we asked parents was, how, what is your comfort level in reduced social distancing, which would be the reality of more students on site, reduced social distancing. And parent surveys showed us 2.99 out of five. All right, and then we get into the staff side of the survey. Little, little differences, um, comfort and returning on site um, as far as the high, continuing the current Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday model, a um, little higher, um, 3.76. Comfort with changing to a different one was low as well. So I think uh, bo both those answers on the parent side and the, and the staff side kind of mirrored each other. Um, re reasonably closely. Definitely not anything that we would say, hey, it's, let's make a drastic switch and, and change this up. Um, comfort level in returning to non-secondary um, block. Comfort level in returning to a non-block, so period schedule at the secondary level, r right in the middle, a little bit under that with the staff. Um, all right, comfort level, reduced social distancing, a lot less comfortable with that than, than the families were. Uh, families were a little bit under that average, um, middle, middle of the road, um, teachers even less. Uh, comfort level returning five days on site with positive rate below 10%, that was higher. So I, th I think that shows um, where the staff was when they took this and what they saw in the community. And if they see the steps in the community, I think there's some willingness to move in that direction as well. So that's kind of what that showed us, I believe. And once again, also a lot of, a lot of comments, a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of things that came out of that. We did read them all. And some people are very frank with their uh, opinions on, on both directions. But you know what? That, we're in that situation, we, we've got to see it and maybe we'll find something that we can do. I think, I think there were some ideas that, that will come out of that and you'll see later on. Next is medical advisory group that this group, it's 15 individuals, it's area physicians, Riley County Health Department officials, educators, school nurse, district administrators and board members. Uh, we've They've been, this medical advisory has helped us understand COVID's impact in our community. You know, the numbers are getting better. We're at, at a spot where, and we'll get into it in a, in a couple minutes, where we are making improvements, but we're also in kind of a tenuous situation. And the community is really, uh, that's part of our conversations with medical advisory has been, the community needs to continue the efforts. We applaud the efforts people have made to improve the positivity rate, the other, other factors we look at, but we've got to continue that it, if we want to accomplish our goal of opening the school. So we've talked about that. Uh, the gating criteria, we've been using gating criteria for a while now that we needed to make sure that our, our metrics are solid, that they're sustainable over time. So we are making comparisons two, three, four weeks from now to now and know that those numbers are consistent. They're coming from the same places. Uh, also the social distancing research, uh, keeping track of what's going on in, uh, for example, in Europe where they've been open for a while, schools have 
smaller social distancing numbers? What are they seeing in terms of the impact on the metrics by doing that as opposed to strict adherence to the six, six feet um, standard that, that we've heard a lot about? So I've had discussions with that group, as I said earlier, weekly uh, as we prepared for this, this meeting and meetings down the road. The next slide gets into a little bit of the information of how we're doing in the schools because we have been doing a good job with containing when there has been outbreaks, following the appropriate protocols, and that's the last bullet there would be teams are doing a great job of following the protocols, doing the reporting, doing the contact tracing, keeping people informed along the way so that we can can manage when there there are occurrences of COVID in our schools, which there are. Uh, that top bullet there, we've had an average of 5.4 confirmed positive cases per week in the district. So that includes staff and students both, which is pretty good. We are seeing a high impact on the schools doing to do the quarantine. And this is, you know, we've talked about it before. Our concern is we 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 are concerned about the students, no doubt about it. But the greater likelihood of our schools getting shut down is going to be because of inavailability of staff. So we've been watching these quarantine numbers that for the week of September 20th, we had 53 students and 22 staff out. For the week of the 27th, we had 85 students and 33 staff quarantine. And you'll see this in chart form in a, in a slide coming up. This is, and, and I believe there's a hand out there for you. This is, oh, you've got it. Oh. Lots of copies. This is the gating criteria people have been waiting to see that we've been working on, double, triple checking uh, numbers. And some of it is the same as we've had in the past in terms of we were paying attention to these things, but we didn't have numbers to go with them. And we really wanted metrics. So we've got more metrics in this for people to be able to watch. It still has uh, what I'd say the qualifiers of it's a decision-making process where we look at the instructional delivery models based on professional judgment of our medical advisory or educators of where are we at? What do these numbers tell us over time that it's not a single number We've heard that before about the positivity rate. Well, the community positivity rate, you know, when it hit a certain number, does, did that trigger we were supposed to go to all distance learning? No, if you look at the bottom of that chart, there was a qualifier there that that was one of the things we looked at as far as, and other factors as well. And we did take into consideration the age group of the students, okay, I'll say students, the KSU students who came in, when we expected they would come in and the numbers would go up, they did go up and they've gone down. But there's, you know, we're also watching about is there community spread beyond that age group now because Kansas State has done a really good job of getting their numbers in line and they're to be applauded for that. But what else is going on in the community? What's going on in the school? So we're continuing to watch those things. Uh, under this, on this chart, under the data points, wanted to call attention to this because people can go different places to get different pieces of data and we're, we wanted to make we're, we want to be consistent with where we're going for it. that the Riley County positivity rate and you'll see that down in the weekly data points the actual numbers but above that explains those data points that the positivity rate comes from Riley County Health Department it's the percentage of people who test positive for the virus out of those overall who have been tested. That's consistent with what we've been doing all along, that it is coming from Riley County. Uh, the second factor there, the incident rate and trend, which again, those numbers are, are down below for the past three weeks from Riley County Health Department. It's the number of new cases per 100,000. Because if we just report new cases, that doesn't give you a very good scale. You know, if it's five new cases in a community of 50, that's a whole lot different than in a community of 500. So this takes it to a scale of number of cases per 100,000. 
And then whether that number is decreasing, increasing, or level. And again, from Riley County Health. There's also the age group incident rate for, and this was new today. When you look at age group 0 to 9, 10 to 17, we've been trying to track age range student age ranges of people who would be students in our school so we do have that number here but it is calculated based on the riley county total population number it's not an incidence rate of zero to nine year olds compared to zero to nine year olds within the community it's the rate of zero to nine to the overall Riley County incident rate. Uh, and that can be confusing, but I think the main thing for people to remember would be if the number goes up, if the number goes down, it's still relative because it's still based on the Riley County population. So that's what we're looking for is wh which direction are those numbers going? Is it trending up, down, or, or level? That we just were not, we're not in a position to be able to consistently report zero to nine year olds to zero to nine year olds overall. So that was a, that's, that's why there's an asterisk on there. But it still gives us important information for tracking. Then there's the average attendance. And these next, the, the, this number comes from our, our data specialist. What's the percentage of individuals attending school? We've got it for students and staff both. So when you look down there, you can see that the student numbers have been consistently around 96% attendance for our on-site students. For staff, again, 92, 91, 91. And historically, staff numbers are below student numbers on tracking attendance. So that's not unusual there. Number testing positive. This is coming from, from our nurses as well as the numbers quarantined. How many students, how many staff are testing positive every week? And you can see the week of 27th, we did have numbers going up in those areas. Then the quarantining, there was a slide earlier that showed about quarantines that uh, when we started tracking this recently, it's gone up from 53 to 85 for students, 22 to 33 for staff. That doesn't mean they test positive, but it does mean like situations, some of the people we know already who have, because of their close proximity to someone who tested positive, they're quarantined. So it still takes them, uh, in some instance, out of, out of action. Sometimes they can work remotely, sometimes, but, but they're not at school. So those are the, the factors we have that we're monitoring, having the discussions with the medical advisory about. And I've, this is a, a good point, a good place to mention medical advisory is that it's advisory. They, they give us the great help, advice, uh, what's the literature saying, what's best practice. But they're not responsible for the ultimate decision of what the schools do. That's us about which direction we go based on, on, on information they give us and others. Uh, the best I can, I, I think it's fair to say, the best I can look for would be, do they support the considerations we're looking at? Or do they have concerns? And if they, have, if, they, if they can't support a direction we're talking about going, then that's a real red flag for us. So their, their support, their input is really important for us. The other side of the chart is more of our stoplight. Char oh, yeah, there it's in color. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Brandy. Um, I just had a quick question. The attendance rate for the students and the staff, uh, is that when they're at school, is it their attendance for the week if they're a hybrid learner? It's the attendance for the week for hybrid learners, so, yes, for on-site So learners. if they're in quarantine, they can still be counted as yes. present as long as they're on their Zoom calls or however they need to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they're doing their daily check-in and participating and... But if they're not doing that, we won't count them as, a, as being in attendance. Yes. So, if you you. Ha so if you had a student who was truly sick, not able to participate, that's going to show up in your attendance mm -hmm. versus 
kids who are quarantined but are still able to engage. Yes, thank you. That's okay. an important distinction for them. And they become and, more of an important distinction. And before you totally flip, mm -hmm. just from sitting in on some of these conversations and just being around and, and hearing questions, one, one piece of information that I found interesting and that I learned from when you talk about that the Riley County Health Department is where we're pulling our numbers, that was meaningful to me to learn that because for those of us that are watching that way too frequently pull up the KDHE website yes. and compare it to the Riley County Health Department website and try to make those numbers make sense, they don't and they're not going to. And it was helpful for me to understand why that was and why it is that we're going to rely upon the health department numbers here locally. And my layman's explanation of that here we go. is that the health, the Riley County Health Department counts all of our positives. They count our antigen positives. They count our PCR positives. So they're going to be more comprehensive than what is showing up on the KDHE website. The KDHE website is only counting PCR tests. So my husband went and got an antigen test at his doctor's office. I went and got a PCR test at my doctor's office. We live in Pot County, so we don't count for Riley County anyway. Mm -hmm. But if we did, one of us would count. We would both count in Riley County, but by KDHE numbers, only one of us would have counted. So and, and thank I you think that is that helpful out. for us to understand and for the community to understand because we're all doing this data shop, not shopping, but we're looking for information. And that was something that made a difference and it made me feel like, okay, where I need to go, where I need to look at is the Riley County Health Department information. Well, and I, just to piggyback on that, because some of us live in Pottawatomie County, so those numbers would be counted in USD 3D3 student numbers, but not, may not be counted in the Riley County age group numbers, correct? Just to make life more complicated. <laughs> you know, and thank you. Those are, those are the examples of, it seems like it should be easier. It, well, it could be a lot easier to just come up with the numbers and say, we're going to go by KDHE. And I think that's where I kind of started would be, we're just going to go by those numbers. Then there's not any question about integrity or anything like that. It's, we go right to their numbers and we use them. But sometimes their numbers were a couple weeks behind. The numbers changed. There, there were as we had the conversations, it became we really need to focus on what metrics are meaningful for us that that are worthy of us putting on a chart and saying we're going to follow it. And and the other piece of information that piggybacks on that as well was that we were waiting for the health department was delayed in getting information from the state versus right now our physician's offices when they conduct tests and when they get test results they are communicating that information directly to the health department and the physician's offices are also communicating directly to our schools when it is an applicable they have a, a release form that parents or patients are filling out so that the doctor's office themselves can make a direct contact to the school nurse so that we're getting mm -hmm. information directly from our local treatment providers rather than waiting on a lab in Nebraska or some other location to bring the information back to us. So communication channels are, are tighter and quicker. More local. And more local for us now in, in part because we're, we're having conversations about these metrics on a ongoing basis. And on the, the other side, the, the stop stoplight chart, it's information from the other side. It's similar. It, it, the positivity rate is the same kind of thing we've done in the past. The incident rate, attendance rates, those other factors down at the bottom, the staffing numbers, the, communi the community medical capacity, you know, how much space is there in the hospital, in the clinic? What, how serious are the cases they're seeing and at what age levels and where are the hot spots in the community? Those conversations continue to go on. Uh, but we do have on here, and, and I, I want, to, want to, again, the transparency piece. Green, yellow, red no longer has on-site, hybrid, all-distance learning. That that uh, 
the conversation we had was that that can be misleading that when you when it's before when it said above well, here on, on on the positivity rate above 15 percent on red if the positivity rate is higher than 15 percent on red but our incident rate is good our attendance rates are good does that one indicator warrant us going to all distance learning uh, the way to resolve that was to take the all distance learning off of the red that it's it, this is part of that in totality what does this information tell us so positivity and it, it does tell us good information that we need to be tracking that for example the 14 day positivity rate that's what it's been before that it's it's but it's all based on the riley county numbers uh week of september 27th it was 9.13 percent puts us you know, pretty solid in the yellow range. The incident rate, again, the number of cases per 100,000, 138. And I, I made a comment earlier about our numbers are good, but we're still in a position where they're tenuous. 138. The attendance rates are, are looking good. So this is where we, we stand right now. This information is going to be shared. It's not a secret. We just wanted a chance to get it to the board first tonight. But these, this is the new uh, gating criteria that we're using. Chris? Just one quick question. Looking at how we were just talking a few minutes ago about how we can count students at, who are at home, if we go face-to-face, -face, that number could change, wouldn't it? I mean, if, if we go face to face and all these kids who are in quarantine, will they still necessarily be able to count as being in school when they're at home, but when they're not having, I mean, that when the classes are going to be, they won't be having all the kids on hybrid anymore. So will we be able to provide as much education for kids who are out on quarantine? That's one of the issues that we have as far as other areas we need to explore further as we, as we move down the line. But the idea would be that similar to when before COVID, when a student was sick, you know, they would be able to do their work, but they would be counted absent because we were back, we were in on site. Uh, anybody remember conversations about that from our team? Um, but there's a difference in being sick and being in quarantine. Yes. Um, and so that's what I think. Um, is there a way for them to still be able to check in or do something? Um, because they they will be required, if I'm correct, they will be required two weeks of still maintaining that work ethic and um, those 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 grades essentially. Okay, right. I'm sorry, I made a jump to being sick as opposed to quarantine. Well, and I was looking just how our attendance rates will be counted. It's going to be kind of this gray area. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We'll have kids who are called who like I called my kids out Monday and Tuesday my son was sick but my daughter was just home because we were waiting on test results so she would have been technically participating in school but home my son although he was participating in school should not have been <laughs> but I could just see those attendance rates when if we're back to school four or five days a week that they, they may drop automatically just because there'll be less opportunities for kids to work at home than they are now when mm. my kids when they were on their Group B days, I didn't have to call them in. <laughs> they did what they That's could, true. and then they caught up over the weekend or whatever. So I'm just saying that number will change if we change formats. I think. Okay. Not yeah. Thanks for the input. I don't have a good response to that other than it's just that's good to know. Of uh, the other part, we have next. What's the next slide? The instructional delivery considerations. I believe that's Paula. Are you going to say something? Oh, I'm sorry, Daryl. Did you have another one? Well, I just have one question about your your medical advisory, especially since we heard from students, we heard from staff, we heard from so many others about mental issues, but I don't see anybody on your mental advisory having any mental uh, a psychologist, psychiatrist, any mental health specialist on we, advisory, and I think that'd be just as important because. Your mental health can make you as sick as your physical health can. Well, make we you. do have people. I I don't think I say parents on there, but there are people that have dual hats. There's a, there's a board member who's a clinician. There's a, a executive director of of special services. 
who deals with the mental health intervention team, she's on that. The physicians are, are in tune with, you know, the mental and emotional st status of their, so I, I guess I would say- A we, physician we is not a mental psychiatrist. I can tell you both are separate. Mm -hmm. So, you know-, you know du Duly noted saying, that, that you said that there wasn't a mental health or whatever you said, I heard you. Yeah, at mental health. But we have 15 people. I mean, yeah, I was hoping Jardine was on there because that was that was something we, we yep, need at least that, a piece of. And that's the board member who's a therapist. Yeah, she is. So. Yep, so we, we do have representation there. And it certainly has also been discussed within that group as well. I mean, it, it, I understand what you're saying, but it from sitting in on those meetings, it, it is a point of the conversation mm -hmm. that is also being discussed as far as um, obviously that the, the mental health, that it all comes into balance, that it's all being weighed in different ways. So my I get you. Is, I guess my concern is the possibility of an increase in suicides within our students. Okay. We do not want any no. of that. We've dealt no. with it once or twice before, I don't want to deal with it again. I certainly don't I, disagree. I feel pretty good that if there's concerns about those areas, that it will definitely come up on this committee based on the on this advisory group, based on the conversations we've had in the past and the way we track things already. What else? Before we go on to the next, section on the, can, can you give an example on the, the attendance rate? So I can see the week of September 13th, 20th, 27th. It looks like we've got a 96% attendance rate with students. Is that normal? Or do we usually have a higher attendance rate? A little. Same thing with staff. It's so a little it's, higher than normal. It's higher than normal, and, okay. And staff would be pre pretty close, yeah. probably a little lower than normal. And that, I mean, again, that's something with the medical advisory we talked about that, you know, do we look at seasonal numbers saying that, well, in the fall, we're going to have lower numbers as flu season comes around and things like that. And, and it was really, we need to be uh, looking at that. Do we start seeing trends with the attendance rate? And, and right now we're, we're, we're doing, we're, we're really pretty good. So, so when we I have been since school then, started. I, I want to be cognizant that a huge factor that we've heard in do we stay in hybrid or do we go to back to in-person is the staffing issue. So what I, what, what's not connecting for me is if these are normal attendance rates, why is, why is the staffing issue? Can you help me understand that? Okay. I, I think I can address this where you've heard shortage mm -hmm. before. We don't have our shortage in there. That's not our ideal staffing. We don't minus those. We have our staff. I mean, Matt's seven custodians he's short aren't taken out of that. It's the custodians we have that get taken out of that. So when you're on a staff shortage, especially on the classified end, be it transportation, food service, and then you get in your licensed staff as well, when you're pretty thin, on where the staff is, yeah, that 91% hurts more than if we're fully staffed. I if see. we're fully staffed, 91% isn't as big of a deal. If we're shorter staff, and that I'll put a plea out in the community, something you can do to help us is if you need a job, come work for 383. And I know that that's been difficult. And part of it's been the unemployment offerings that it's not a financial benefit as much because the financial benefit of being on employment was higher than what we we can do in those positions and that i think that's seen across the community as well in in those those positions so we need people in those positions and the more people we have uh, the better fully staffed we are the better we can stomach that 91 percent but um as as aaron said you know you put the hammer hemorrhage nor normally at 91 percent we're going to be bleeding a little bit, but when you're short staffed, you know, when, when I tell Matt, you know, when, when he's already seven guys down and five people call in, that hurts. If he's full staff and five people call in, he'll be a little annoyed. He'll 
figure out a way to cover it, but it's more difficult to do so the shorter staff you so are. What's the what's the percentage of, of open staff positions we have? I see staff approximately 1,400. A ballpark of how many open positions we have. How many pairs you got? Yeah, that's down 50 to 100. That's that's pretty big between 50 and 100. It's it's different because some of our paras work two days a week. Uh -huh. uh, so it's, I see. the so numbers as as higher, but positions the positions were down around 50. Uh -huh. As oh, far okay. as human bodies that we've typically had, Makes it's sense. closer to 100. So down 50 paras, or is that 50? Positions. We can say positions. 50 positions. Okay. Out of 1,400 total staff. And, and I would add on with the rest of the classified ball, ballpark, quick ballpark off the top of my head, another 50. Okay. Between transportation, custodial food service. Always take more subs. Always, always want to take more subs in there. But we, we just haven't had the applicants and we've been fighting. We've been fighting to get those in there. So can, can just along those lines and mm -hmm. talking about staffing, can you, can you give us an example of what happens in a staffing issue? Because that's what I, I, I think a key piece of this puzzle, the dominoes as Aaron um, Meyer Gambrell called them, what, what happens if we come back to school and then there is a teacher who is quarantined and cannot be there and you don't have substitutes? Can you lay out what that looks like? And you know, what are the discussions that we've had? I know Andrea has dealt with that. Andrea's probably been a more first hand here than I have. So I've been really, really impressed with our people. We have amazing teachers and we have amazing families. Um, it is a ripple effect, like you said, but what families, what we're having to do is maybe a group of people are impacted and those teachers or those staff are switching to virtual instruction for those kids that are off site. So those, they're still receiving instruction. We're still trying to continue normal, as normal as possible. Um, but it does impact how we can teach kids if they're on site and somebody is off site. So we're having classrooms covered maybe with somebody and the teacher is videoing in to still teach the students. So they're trying everything they can to still connect with their kids. Yeah, we, we've seen a lot of different situations and it depends on the situation depends they're the in situation. and it depends on the situation their family's in. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if you're on a quarantine because your, your student, your child, uh, is sick, really sick, it's going to be more difficult for them to remote in and teach those classes. But if you're on a quarantine, they're on a quarantine, you're all home, you know, they've had an opportunity and our staff has been very good about, uh, we always ask the question, what can you do? Yeah, we know you have to stay home this week, but what can you do? Where can you fill in? Where can you help? And, and they've been great about all those things, trying to fill those holes in. So fill a hole here, have someone on site cover that end, um, you know, get a substitute to cover a class. Um, some, sometimes it's been the interns teaching, but we have, we, we can't leave an intern in there by themselves. So you gotta have a substitute in there, but they've been picking up a load or maybe taking some remote classes. They, it, it's basically an all hands on deck type thing where, where we're scrambling. And the, but the more times that happens, the more you have to scramble. And, and the pressure that puts on and I'll, I'll just throw out an example for like a Matt, you know, when, when, when he's short staffed and someone calls in sick, there's still things we need to get done in the building. So, um, maybe we're, we're not doing vacuuming along the thing because the priority is wipe downs mm -hmm. and maybe they got to do wipe down in their building plus another building. And sometimes that means overtime hours. So we're, we're probably, uh, as, Aaron said plastic balls, glass balls, you know, let vacuuming. I, I like them vacuum. I like my floors clean. I like all that stuff. But if it's choice between wiping down and vacuuming, we choose wiping down. So we, we make sure we do that and it's going to cost us more overtime hours. One of, one of the things you get into a hesitancy there, if people are continually being pushed to overtime, continually being pushed to overtime. They didn't sign on for that. Then they, this is too much. This isn't what I signed on for. Um, or Matt's maintenance guys um, that drive buses on a very consistent basis because we're short staffed on transportation as well. And and we we thank a lot of groups for their hard work and and that's that's warranted. Uh, I this is a place where I have to say our business department and our human resources folks 
have been doing a great job with keeping in touch with all of these individuals that are quarantined that are out. Who can work, who cannot, how many days do they have, what, you know, keeping track of all of those things. So uh, people know where they stand in the district over time as, as we move through this. Yeah. And that's uh, been, again, a greater burden on them and that we haven't even talked about before. So I thought this is a good time to bring it up. Yeah. And I, I want to mention just one more thing. We certainly want to protect our people when they are ill um, and need time to just rest and recover. And we don't, I don't want that message to be, well, we still expect you to teach. If they are sick, if they are out, they, we want them to rest and, and be well so they can be back with us as soon as possible. Is that, is that show you somewhat of a picture? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Good. Thank you. Paula. So at, oops, thank you. So at the board meeting on the 16th, a lot of the discussion kind of seemed to um, polarize between safety and instruction. And so we've talked a lot about the safety components this evening. We talked about the medical advisory, the social distancing, those pieces. But when we look at it from the instructional side of things, we've been having a lot of conversations. And the data that Eric and Andrea shared did reflect this um, from parents as well as staff. So that input has been received. We did ask for it. And, you know, as they both said, we got significant numbers from them of what it is that they want. I think that it's really important to remember that this is at least the hybrid learning is our contingency plan. This was not elected for the instructional merits of it, but because of the safety component. So no one was really excited in doing any dances that we were in hybrid because we were going to be able to provide the best instruction possible. We're here because of all of that criteria that goes into the gating that Dr. Wade went over. So thinking about moving forward when the numbers continue to get better and sustain, these are the conversations that we're having. And I know at that 16th meeting, we had all been hearing from both ends of the spectrum on some of these topics. And we really expected different results on that survey. We truly expected to be able to be like, oh, we can do this because it's what everyone wants, because that's what we are hearing. It was all in the middle. So many of them were in the middle because there's such strong opinions on both ends of the spectrum that it really made us feel more confident with the hybrid and what we are doing because it's consistent, all of those things. But we have talked, we thought that there would be a no brainer with shifting those days and reducing the number of day or increasing the number of days between when students saw staff. So changing that A group to Monday and Thursday and the B group to Tuesday and Friday. But that's not, neither group was a fan of that option. So we talked about that, we thought about that, and again, transportation, there are so many residual effects of it, but it just, instructionally, it was not, it would be better, it would, because we'd be able to spread it out, but that isn't what either of those groups wanted. Secondary, this was one that did have a little bit of gray area. Again, the day before that board meeting, I had two parents in my office talking about this, saying, you know, if, if this change doesn't happen, I might have to pull my student out. One of these parents, very educated, I mean, just great, involved, everything parents said, I can't do this. And so when that came back and I wrote that one down, the parents, it was 3.38, but the staff, it was 2.47. Instructionally, yes, that would be much better. I think Michael Doris would attest to that in a second, that if we were able to have those seven periods in a day, or Vicki Klein or Tracy Newell. Instructionally, yes, but it's not the safety component makes it murky and makes it so those transitions and lunch and all of those things are, it's difficult. It's not impossible, but there are so many dominoes that come up as a result of this. It's not simply Oh, okay, we'll go back to seven hours. We have that schedule from last year. But it is all of those pieces that overlap with the safety component. One of the things that's really hard is um, the comparisons to other districts. Um, I, I get it. We want to watch what other districts are doing and learn from them, and that's great. It's, it's, it is what it is. But we have different buildings. We have different transportation. We have different child. Everything is unique to each district. So the phase in, um, we've, we've had a lot of conversations about this as well. A lot of dis, not a lot, 
some districts in our area are starting with the younger students. There are benefits to that, absolutely. But where does the risk outweigh the benefit? What does that look like and how do we balance that teeter-totter? The continuing remote learning and hybrid, looking at this survey, it was not a resounding, nope, not gonna keep doing this. It wasn't, and the same thing with professional development. We have a day on Monday and Canvas is one of the options and the staff aren't in that dire need according to what the, red, the enrollment looks like for the sessions. I'm not gonna make assumptions. It's not that dire need anymore of, I need this, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, there's frustration, of course, but they're moving past that and getting to the point where they're able to, they're doing amazing things every single day and hopefully being able to take those five minute deep breaths at least um, instead of a month ago where it was just so urgent, crisis mode at all times. So I feel like based off of what they are enrolling in and what their interests were that it is getting better. And another thing that we have talked about is moving to um, that four day instructional week and bringing students that are enrolled in on site back on site um, four days a week. We've talked about all of them. There are pros and cons to every single thing. Um, there was no concise data that said, yes, let's do this. There was a lot of 2.5, 2.7, because there are a lot of zeros and a lot of fives throughout the survey. So it's, it was really difficult to look at that data, honestly. And now Eric's taken over with a lot more gritty stuff. Yeah, considerations for targets for on-site learning. So someday, someday it's got to change. And that's what we're here for. You know, we're, we're here to be a school for everybody. This is a contingency. So someday the factors are going to turn around. Now, when that factor is, we don't necessarily know for sure. And there's a lot between now and then that can change. And as much as people want certainty, I want certainty. I don't think there's anybody that wants more certainty than I want certainty. Um, but certainty comes from information that's not variable, that doesn't change. And I was telling Dr. Wade today, I feel like, you know, in algebra, you get the A plus B, you know, and you, and you, you solve for X, but you only have one variable. And then you get to algebra two, maybe you got two variables you got to solve for. Well, right now we're going to get 40 variables and we don't know what those variables are but we know we have to prepare for them yeah and 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 trying to get all that looped in to what we want to do we want to set some targets out too um that if we, we what we see is the community percentage rate of incident rate is going down i, I think that's that's pretty easy to see people can see that and when that was the metric, um, I, I want to remind everybody at the beginning of this process, when we were putting out our original plan, that gating information came in really late. That was not even a part of anything from KSDE till about maybe a couple days before our first draft plan went out. Mm -hmm. That's all we had to go on. And we didn't really have a lot of time to vet what should truly be in our gating. What, what gives us the information we need to make the decisions we need to make? And... I feel like the gating conversation has been good, slow, but good and positive in giving us the information as far as seeing what's going on in the community, seeing what's going on specifically with kids, seeing what's specifically going on in USD 383 buildings. And I think that you put those things together, but you, you see some uh, increase or some decreases going on in the community what you hope is that turns our incident numbers down and it turns our absence rates down and it trends us all in the same direction. So when we see those opportunities, when, when's the time to make that shift? And if we don't target something, we're never going to get there. You know, because we, uh, if we want to play the what if card, we're going to be able to play the what if card forever on this and we're not going to know. So, we wanted to set some things in place to continue to improve remote and hybrid learning. Now, something that did come from the surveys um, by and large was it is getting better. It's getting better. It's still hard, um, still not ideal, still not what we want, still not what we signed up for. It has room to improve, but I will say over and over again, I saw on there, it was getting better. 
Um, saw that on staff, seen that from staff when I've gone around the buildings, how are you doing? It's getting better. They're not where they want to be. Most of them are perfectionists and they want to be at an elite high level. That's what makes us, you know, that's what makes 383, 383. We got a lot of people that shoot really high, which causes them like Aaron to stay up late because they, they want to be that driven person to do everything they can for their kids. And I hope they don't do it at the expense of escorting them out of the profession someday or they're insane. We, we got to try to protect them from that. I give them, I always try to give them permission. You can only do what you can do. Don't, don't put yourself on, on that line where you're running yourself down too far, where you got nothing to give. You can't empty your bucket. So what we, what we'd like to propose is a target um, to remain in hybrid through October 30th. That, that'll get us past elementary conferences. We got some funky weeks as far as how, how all that stuff lines out. Closely monitor our gating criteria with a medical advisory. That's continuing to look at all those, all those different factors um, that come into play. And if we see that improvement happening, um, throw a target out there to increase our on-site learning days. And some of the considerations we put forward, we th we've thought about a lot of things, like, you know, you think about the five days full back, but we talk about increasing on-site learning days to four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and I've got more information about that coming, um, starting on November 2nd is, is a goal. We'd like to see that if, um, that if we see the advancement in the communities with the numbers and our metrics, that we would like to set that out as a goal that, that we, we would like to work toward. Um, but, but the data has to support it. And, um, Hopefully we can have a recommendation two, week, two weeks from day, we'll be right back here. And, and the data will be the data. It, it is what it is. It can tell us some different things. And you'll see that the data is telling us different things already. Because you see as the community rate drops, our number has gone up. You know, our number of rates now is at an acceptable level. That's what we have to work through and see, look at the trend. Um, but that staff quarantine, you know, that increased 30% in a week. That's something we're going to have to watch and be careful with. So if those met metrics keep trend lining in that way, even if the community positivity rate goes down, we might not be in a good position to do that. But I hope in two weeks we'd be able to make that, make that decision in time for people to have some time to move some things around because this is what we want. We want face-to-face -face learning. We want people back as much as possible, but we want to do it safely too. And we don't want to put ourselves in a position or we're pushing too far and we end up fully remote um, very, very quickly. Because as, as we've seen, this can snowball really quickly, really quickly in some places. So that, that's kind of our goal to have something um, for, the next, for the next meeting. And that with our intention is we'd like to go back four days. Yes, so, ma'am. So I, I wanna be clear that um, for this upcoming decision, the recommendation is remain in hybrid through October 30th and then for what's happening after that, the recommendation is, well, you're saying you're going to come to the board on October 21st uh, with the target of remaining four, four days a week in school starting November 2nd. All of our on-site kids, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. four days a week. Okay, so so then what's the process? Let's let's say that we, we go back to school and then is it week by week that we're evaluating the gating criteria? And, and so what's the heads up that we're going to give to families and staff on how we're going to flex one way or the other? If we were go to go back in person and then all of a sudden we have um, the, the data points or the factors that we're using points to red or whatever, right? How much time are we giving staff and families to then transition? A week or two weeks, same to what we said before. So one, one to two weeks. And mm -hmm. is that week by week? So this said that it would be updated every Wednesday. So on Wednesday, it's updated. And so does that mean, therefore, the following Wednesday? We, we will be monitoring the trends, just like we've done, that it, we've, we've stayed in hybrid, that we're not going to be doing mm -hmm. this based on one or two weeks. So, you know, we're, we'll, be, we'll be watching it, having the conversations about what's the medical community seeing going on in the community, when is a good opportunity for us to make a move, and to do like we're doing tonight. Tonight we're talking about letting people know these are the things we're looking at. October 21st, when we come back, we're going to be 
these are the things we will have looked at between now and then. So we'd continue that process on looking at what's the, what are the metrics telling us could be a possibility down the road so people can at least have that thought in their head that we might have to go that direction. But we, we can't afford to be going back and forth on and, a regular so, basis. So family members that are probably listening in on this, they can expect some consistency and that they're not going to be jerked around back and forth. One yeah, way just or like the other. they've received up to this point. I, I would say we will be as consistent as possible until we have to, until we have to change something and, and until we're forced by the data and we're forced by the situation. You know, if we're forced by our staff, there's not a lot we can, we can do about that, but we want to be able to show and explain um, where we're at on those things. But yeah, we want to hang on to what we're doing, um, especially when we get them on site. Absolutely. Okay. So that that kind of brings up, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but well, maybe now. But what's the the risk benefit yep. that we want to take? That really, at this point, we look at four days a week because of because of schedules, because of a deep cleaning on Wednesday. We can bring the the on site kids back four days a week. We could bring. We could stay in hybrid. We could bring them back four days a week. We could only bring back the elementary students. We could bring back elementary and secondary. But if we bring back elementary and secondary, that risk goes up because of the distancing, the schedule changes with secondary as opposed to elementary. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this balance of what's the comfort level and what do we need to be looking at between now and October 21st to be able to make that recommendation. And what's the risk level that the board is willing to take? The safe, in some ways, the safest thing would be to stay in hybrid. It seems to be working, but it comes at a cost on another way. Mm -hmm. If we bring them back, uh, so I mean, I think you know, like the three scenarios we're looking at. And I think the the data up there, and Dr. Wade went over that four four days a week is a possibility. I, I would also say a four day a week is a step toward normal without a full step toward normal. And I, I think it'll help in a lot of ways. And um, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the session the other day, but one of those things was stress, you know, trying to reduce the stress level. Um, you know, if you take your parents on, on the on-site, you're going to four days from two days. So you're, you're doubling the time, you're reducing the remote days from three to one. And, my math would say that would should reduce something. It won't eliminate. I don't think. I don't think elimination of the stress is going to be there. Um, but also on the, on the staff end, uh, because putting more students in a classroom is going to increase stress. And you know, I we we talk about health, mental health, and all those things. I also saw a lot of comments on there. My anxiety is lower because of smaller class sizes. I'm not fearful about this because of that. Not, not to say that discredits the other side, but it, there's a counter thing on almost everything we have, which makes this so difficult, so difficult. Um, but if we're waiting in that pool, you know, and, and taking that step, um, also the schedules that are worked out with four days can or with the hybrid on the two day, two day can translate very easily into full days or day, four full days for all the on-site kids without changing a lot of the schedules that will, it, it does make it easier on your staff because they don't have to rearrange everything. We don't have to rearrange the special schedules. Um, we don't have to push people. They can still, if you're a remote specials teacher, you can stay in that capacity, which is going to keep their stress at a lower level than if we came back a five full, five full days. But also, we always want that hope is someday we want to get back to five full days. That's what we want. That's what we want to see. And this can be a step toward getting there as well. So I know taking the middle of the road sometimes is not popular because you get nailed on both sides. And I know we've, we've felt that way a lot of the time too. But a four days is a good transition step as far as from our administrative side to, to make that possible on, on both ends. Christian, go ahead and then Kurt. I'm sure that there are many families jumping up and down, clapping, totally excited at this option. <laughs> there probably are some families, though, that may have health concerns that are thinking, um, 
is it an option for me to then to put my kids in full-time remote if this change happens? And I know, especially with secondary and high school kids, they're, in, they're not having a grade end of grade period. They're well into their classes. So where are we at with discussions or planning for that possibility? Or is that, it not going to be a possibility? That's a very good question. Um, we, we've, we've asked for those that want to change to submit that by, I believe, next Friday. And, and what we want to do is we want to honor as many of those as we possibly can. Um, probably the tightest window we have is some of our remote classes being continually overloaded. So that's going to be a more difficult switch than bringing people on site. Being, being on site is something if you're remote and you want to check on site. Because I've had it both ways that people say, well, if, if we're not going more days, I just want to go remote anyway. But if you have... You know, if you if you go back full time, I, I want them there, and we have remote students that want to go. But the we asked that question on the parent survey that if this then that and it was it was about ten percent said they would want to change, but it was in both directions. Now whether that ends up correctly at second grade TR, or you know fifth grade Bergman, <laughs> and evens out, that's going to be one thing. So. I think we're going to honor as many requests as we can across the board. What I will say is because it's difficult to move people around right right now, probably not a popular time to take an elementary teacher that's been connected to 15 kids and working with that class and say, I'm sorry, you know, you need to go here. I need to rearrange my entire staffing, but we will look at rearranging that staffing at semester. And I want to give Erin some hope out there. She talked about staffing. I'm looking at what we can do at semester. Um, we did have some late resignations. We have filled almost all of those mm -hmm. positions with, with people. But there's other positions I believe we can fill to help help the burden. Um, we're opening that new school next year. We're moving sixth grade in. It's a good time to bring people in the middle school. It's a good time to bring some extra people. But when you're sitting there on August 10th, the people you have, it, it's it's limiting. We live in Manhattan, Ogden. That's our district. We've got a great university right down there with some of the finest student interns graduating in December or November. November. Graduating in November this year, even though they'll finish their coursework in December. We've, we've got a great opportunity to pick up some people. We've had some um, teachers in other districts as well that said we could get there in January, but we can't get there right now. So I, I know there's some interest um, in, in coming to 383. As some of that's been how we've approached this. I felt I think they felt like we've tried to respect staff, even though their staff have struggled. I don't think there's any question. Nobody's doing well in this. No one no one's got this going. But I think we've been respectful and in, in considering all parties all the way through. And I think that's attractive to people on the outside. And we've had a few say we'd love to come over. And work for you because you're going to at least listen and, and you're going to try and you got good people to work with. So I think there is a possibility of expanding those things. Uh, that being said, I think those requests to go remote um, next semester, we do them all and, and we figure out a way to get all of them covered, be that new staff, be it rearrange the schedule. And I've told my secondary principals, I've told them all, um, that's the goal. That's what we're going to be shooting for because we're going to have to rearrange things. And that may mean redoing the schedule. You know, and um, one, one of the things we talked about on um, one of the benefits of a block schedule at the secondary is it gave us extra lunches. Um, high school has run on two lunches for how long, Michael? Or Mr. Dorr, sorry? Forever. So <laughs> to infinity and beyond. And <laughs> Middle schools run on two lunches as well. Well, middle school with a block schedule, when, when you have lunch, it's you generally over one period. And when you have a block schedule, the middle schools are getting four lunches in, the high school's getting three lunches in. So that greatly spreads out our kids. When we go to period schedule, you can two lunches. That's pretty much all you can do. Unless all your fourth and fifth hour line up exactly right where it, it, it's really hard to do. So I've challenged them. Can we go back to a period schedule? Is there a way we can set that schedule up? Is there a way we do period schedule and then block fourth and fifth hour only for lunch? Because I do think when you bring everybody back on site, you're doubling the amount of kids you have at lunch. When's the one time we unmask lunch? 
and you're bringing the most people together. So I think we need to be careful, as careful as we possibly can. So keeping some of that stuff in play um, kind of helps us down the line. But I would expect to honor as many requests as we can to answer your question. How many that is, it really depends because it depends who's coming back and who wants out. But that semester, and I also think in all honesty and respect to our families, when we asked them what they wanted to do at the beginning of the year, they didn't know what they were choosing. I don't know if we knew what they were choosing 100%. I think we probably had a 50% chance of being able to tell them what it was going to look like. Well, now I think they have a better idea what, what it looks like. So if we asked those families and we'd probably ask them earlier on, not, not in December, but even back in November, what's your intention for semester? which gives us time for high school to rearrange those staff and to put those classes into play, allow the counselors time to do it. Same thing at the middle school level. And we honor all those requests. So if you think you need to go remote, I think they're making a more informed decision about going remote than they did back in August or even now. So I think we're gonna try to honor all those requests um, next semester, but for now it's as many as we possibly can. Yeah, where, I'm, where I'm anticipating hearing a lot of issues is with high school students who took hybrid because they wanted the classes that they wanted and they knew they couldn't get them if they did remote. But now they're looking at November 2nd, yep. well into the semester and wanting to finish the schedule that they have. But for whatever reason, I just think we're going to hear about that. So just start thinking about. Yeah, that's possible. And that's not that's fair. But also, I'm not sure if there's a way around it yeah. either. Kurt, go ahead. I, I, I'll be very fast. You don't have to answer. I, I don't need a 15 minute answer from you, but um, <laughs> that's supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> it's, it's late. So, I, I mean, I think one of the advantages that we're going to have is because roughly 18% of the kids are all remote, and that takes about five kids out of each grade school classroom. So, that'll give us a little more space there. But my question was kind of the opposite of what Kristen asked. What about the kids that? say well we don't want to go that are all out and want to go all in but i think you kind of answered that really just if if they're all out and want to go in i don't believe we can not grant that request right, no, that's what yeah, we, no, we can you go to the next would, slide yeah. Yeah. i think th this might help because this kind of speaks into that so yeah when you do take those remote kids out of the elementary classrooms um 34 percent of those classrooms have above 20 students per class 34. Five of them have more than 25. I can tell you if I put that up there last year. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, every, everybody be dancing, doing cartwheels if that was last year. Um, but it's not. So the, the class size is more favorable. Now, at the secondary level, it's, it's going to be higher. Uh, you're you're going to have a lot more. I, I call them red spots. You know, the, the higher that is, the redder the spot is. But at the elementary level, you got a, less red spots. Than you've had before you know i wanted to say about almost half of the classrooms had between 10 and, or 15 and 20 kids in them i I, th I think we can do a decent job social distancing maybe not get quite six feet but four to five but we're still gonna have a few classrooms that are up at the top level and i think one that shows when you see how many kids were down you know we're down 300 kids plus we take out 800 and you know, 70 some for remote, and we're still at the classroom capacities we're at, I think speaks to how overcrowded our elementary schools have been. Right. And that, that's an amazing thing to me, even though we've got some empty rooms because we transition teachers out. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we can take that hit and we still are going to have some 28, 29 class sizes across the board. Um, but because there aren't as many of them, and we do have some open opportunity. I do think there's some opportunities to spread some of those hot spots out a little bit more at the elementary level. It'll be harder at the high school or at the secondary level because I'll throw my middle school friends in that too. Um, but I, but I think there's some things we can try and do as well to try and favor that as well. So that that kind of gets gets into where we're at because it, when. If we do this and we go more on site and we're able to do this, obviously, you know, social distancing decreases buses. There's there, there's not a there's not a different way to do it other other than get it done and do it as safely as possible. Keep masks, keep good hygiene, keep our hands to ourselves. Um, 
So we know we're risking something there, um, but is the reward out, outweigh that all the way through? And I think this is this is a step we, we can take toward more normal, more readily things, and it'll show us what we can do to if the conditions are favorable enough. So I hope all the people jumping up and down doing cartwheels at the potential of this remember their due diligence to be very faithful in doing what they're doing, um, what we need families to do right now to get those numbers going in those directions are is what we need to do right now. And I know we say that every meeting, but it's true. It's so true. Uh, child nutrition. Uh, yeah, just, just FYI, um, before we do a major change, um, Stephanie needs two weeks order order out on our thing. So um, if we're going to greatly increase the number of students that are coming to the building on a daily basis, Stephanie needs pretty big heads up to make sure she does that too. So I, I, we always want to give people as much time as we possibly can to do that. And I know Dr. Wade's committed um, to doing the very best he can on that. Daryl, did you have a question? Yeah, there's a couple bits. Uh, it sounded like you were willing to spread out some of our classes either in the district or maybe pick up a classroom or something elsewhere. But we would need a teacher or a para to fill that, right? Or to oversee that with a remote teacher or something. Are you talking about other facilities? Yes. I, I think venturing into that, we haven't got a lot of talk on that yet, but yes, you're, you're correct um, that if we would expand out into other other venues, pro probably not going to be a high priority for us just because there's a lot of logistics involved in getting permission, getting licensed, making sure it's clean, you know, yeah. all, all the logistics that go with it. But it's also the staffing, too, that we have to bring someone with them to do that. And when we're, when we're razor thin staff, it's hard to spread out more. And I, I think that's true in the mornings, too. You know, when, when people are coming into school and, you know, middle school kids, they'll go to the cafeteria, they'll go to the gym. We try to spread them out as best we can based on our staff availability. The fewer staff we have, the tighter it is. The more staff we have available, the more spread out it is. So we will spread them out as much as we're able to do. Yeah, I mean, I was reading about Heston and they were, they had gotten other facilities, gyms. Maybe they moved a class to a gym because of a 30 student size and the move teacher and everybody to the gym. I don't know. Yeah. And but, I think we, we have some classes at the high school already shifting over in the auditorium and the little theater. I, I think we have that on some level, but there's only so many of those spots over there to do. Cause yeah, you could shift into a gym, but we have gym classes every hour <laughs> in, in there. So there's only so far you can, you can spread them out, but I think they, they will do that to the maximum they can. It, in our conversations internally, we've talked about we don't want to we don't want to include that in our calculations about what we're doing that we're going to be able to use other facilities that we have to be able to make the commitment we make based on the social distancing we can control in our schools. So that would mean if we say we're bringing students back, we're planning on bringing the students back to our schools. Now, if we find some opportunities between now and the twenty first. That'd be great, but uh, at this point, we're not planning on that for, for reasons okay. Eric said with transportation, food service, staffing, liability issues. Yeah. It's a variable we can't control yet, but if we can, I think we'd explore. I mean, well, even East Campus, we have spaces in there, I thought, that we could use. But uh, beyond that, your big problem is paras. My big complaint about paras for how many years I've been here, nine years, is the salary. Would it help if we made a decision, even though it's halfway through the year, to increase salaries on them? I mean, at nine fifty an hour that you're starting at, there's people at McDonald's that make more than that. I'm sorry, but <laughs> I'm expecting more out of a pair than I am a somebody flipping a hamburger. So... I mean, it's just a question. Would it help get fill those positions if we made that salary change at some point? I, I think logically, yes, additional, a higher salary would help. 
it would make the, the position more appealing and we would get hopefully more applicants in theory. I mean, and, and we're in a bad year. So, you know, if it was only a 50 cents or 75 cents an hour for however many you're looking at, I'm sure somebody could give us an answer how much that would cost us to do that. I'd want to be careful about when we when we bump that up, then are we shifting the problem that now we're losing transportation people to become paras and, and moving it around from food, you know, child nutrition? I just, I appreciate the thought. Just want to be careful for the people that are listening to think that that's just going to miraculously happen now. Well, it's not miraculous, but... And the bus driver makes a whole lot more than a para. I will say we, we've been weighing those internally just on pr pretty small level, but there's a lot of complicators. Well, I'm just it's not as easy as it sounds. So many every week on paras, it's crazy. So there's got to be something we can improve upon that. I think we can certainly keep looking at it. And that's something we're going to need spreading kids out. Shifting discussion from what Daryl was saying. Something that I don't see on here is um, specific bullet comments on the problem solving on how the, the continued things that we're going to do to help teachers. We heard from Ashley earlier tonight and Aaron both still seem overwhelmed by this. And I feel like they're a voice of, of what most classroom teachers are, are experiencing. One thing that I just is unfathomable is the remote teachers that can't even see all the kids on on their on iPad or computer that they're teaching off of. That's one example, right? What so what are some of the the examples of problem solving steps that we're working through to give teachers more assistance, more professional development, more canvas training, additional monitors? What are some of those things? It's late. Canvas is ongoing. We do have trainers at every building as well as our, okay, I was like, did she really leave? Our district trainer is here watching this as well, but we um, are continuously doing that. It is hard that we shifted, you know, so many days to August now. Um, I get it and I still agree with that decision, but we do have October 12th is a professional development day and they selected their choices for what that is as well as grade level or department collaboration time because I think that's one of the most important things that they can have right now is just that time to collaborate. Um, continuing moving forward with personalized learning, some of those other pieces that really are focusing on blended learning, things like that. Um, it's just continuing to support as much as we possibly can and allowing or redefining parameters like with Canvas we talked about with the earlier grades just not every single assignment needs to be posted in Canvas but we're not moving away from Canvas either so finding those finding that balance um, just yeah I, and I yes please I, I think that that's a valid point too and I think a lot of the things we put together in the timelines I, I would say what we try to do is our timelines one thing that stresses them out more than anything is a quick turn. And I, and I will tell you, you know, per, perception can be sometimes at the September 16th meeting. I think there was a lot of fear and anxiety that the board's going to come in and step in and change this mode of operation next week. And anxiety's high. And the shorter window we have on transitions, the higher the stress level's going to be. The more time they get with it, and there, there's a reason why we put November 2nd out there instead of, you know, bef before that time. And it's to give them a little extra time to ease that transition in. That's another reason for four instead of five is stress level be less for them on four than it would on five and work our way into that. So a lot of the decisions we've made on there is try to give people as much time as we possibly can to ease us into those transitions. And, and then to listen, keep, and to, listen yeah. to them with the things that they say they need and then to do what we can to meet those needs that they know better. Th those teachers know better than I do 
about what they need. And when they get together, when they meet in their buildings, when they meet in their grade level meets, whatever, however it is they meet, they, they problem solve a whole heck of a lot better than I can do for them. And that was one of the things we knew when we put the plan together that when they get in, they'll figure these things out. Now we have to going back to, I think your original question would be, then we have to try do the best we can to get them the things they say they need whenever we can. Daryl. Uh, I didn't know if you wanted feedback or not on what your thought was of bringing elementary kids back first and four days a week. I love those ideas. But, I mean, I didn't know if you, you wanted any feedback, but I like starting that. So I, we, yeah, we'll, we'll get there, I think. I'm sorry, I know this has been a long, but, and, and I think we've addressed a lot of this stuff too on the continue. We, we just didn't want to miss anything um, that we wanted to set out for you guys on monitoring. So continue problem solving. There's things that are gonna have to continue. Like, uh, you know, mo most of your questions, you guys are well ahead. Of, of all those things on how to monitor that, that that's going to have to be a continually rolling re -eval. It's something that's always going to have to be out in front. It's something we're going to have to communicate on. Um, you know, we, we need to have our temperature out there too on how close we are. And like I said, when that gives more time to people along the way. So continuing, um, if there's more PP&E we need along the way, try to listen to people, try to see and do what we can. At the beginning, we were purchasing things. We didn't know if we needed them or not. Um, I think people have a better idea of what we need now. Um, benefits and risk, instructional needs, social, emotional, just there's so many things to weigh out and we appreciate that too. And I think even all your feedback we've had so far help us balance out that stuff. And Staffing needs its semester. So yeah, they pretty much covered this whole thing through your questions. Kurt? Just a really quick comment, just to answer what Katrina had asked earlier. I, I went about three weeks ago, I bought a, a new TV, a, a 60 inch TV and gave it to, to uh, Aaron. And so she can see all of her kids now through a Zoom using a 60 inch monitor. So, and I, and I have enough people lined up that are willing to donate to buy 53 more to give. That to other teachers. That's exactly what I'm talking right. about. But and, those are but, really yeah. tactical, helpful things that if the teacher says that they want it, let's deliver on those things because they're yeah. immediate things that we can do to impact. Thank you, Kurt. Such <laughs> a Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'd be down for one donation. Yes, you are. You Civics Plus. <laughs> right, exactly. We'll put a plaque on it and everything. It'd be great. We're on slide number 18 of 19, so we're getting there. Uh, it, is, it is frustrating, and at least for me, you know, just having these conversations tonight, I feel the tension, and, and it might even show that we've had these conversations ongoing basis, trying to solve myriad of, of situations, looking at all these different variables, and it still comes down to we're going to have to make a decision, and it's not going to—it's going to be as informed as it can be. But uh, I, and I'll say, Daryl, I apologize about how I responded with the mental health piece on that committee. That was a great question, but well, well, no. But the but the re, but but the what I thought when I was answering that was that is not going to make a difference on whether we bring elementary and secondary back or if we come four days. There's a thousand of those things that we're considering. And it's going to it's going to come down to what risk are we willing to take, and who's going to decide that. So I, I just wanted to you know that we're you know we're looking at all the things we can, and it's still going to be an uncomfortable situation. But we know people want to move. We've seen the numbers from the staff. We've seen the numbers from the the parents about what they want. We hear from the medical community. Uh, and part of what we hear is if there's a time to do this, the time is coming soon, that the weather is going to change, that if, if we want to try to make a move, we've got to be looking at around that time that we're, we're talking about now and how far, how far we want to go with it is the thing that we have to consider. But uh, the numbers are improving and we just keep, I think we preached it like three times during this program about you know, that we've heard about the toolboxes. 
We need to maximize all the tools we can in the schools. We need to maximize all those tools we can in the community with the masks, the sanitizing, social distancing, all of those things that, you know, we've got October 21st. We're going to be looking at everything we can between now and October 21st to be ready to, to come to the board with with where we're at on it. And, and want to thank everybody who's who's worked hard to get the numbers down where we can even have this conversation. So, you know, I, I, I think the main thing now would be any more questions that you have, anything, any input you want to give as far as where we go with it now. And any thoughts about, you know, the, the idea of um, the four day a week, I, I think we feel strongly about four day a week works a lot better than five right now because of schedules, cleaning, other things. Uh, elementary, secondary, there's, like I said before, greater risk with secondary than with elementary. I think we're kind of at a, uh, we're going to have to, for us, we're going to have to see where those numbers are by the 21st yeah. before we could feel comfortable going one way or the other. And we can split those out, elementary, secondary, both staff and student too. So. Mm -hmm. Brandy? Just a quick question, I promise we'll be out here in two minutes. <laughs> Was there any consideration when you're talking four days a week, was there ever a consideration about moving that off day or remote day, I don't know what you want to call it, to a Monday or Friday, considering that there has to be a 72-hour window? I, mean, I was just curious mm -hmm. kind of if that was discussed and if, if Wednesday yeah. is the best day. Yeah. Sorry. You know, we did talk about that as an option, um, but the whole premise around that Wednesday was to clean in between groups but then it got, kind of gives us a buffer in the middle of the week where we can we can focus on that cleaning. And we've really been able to get into buildings quickly when we've had positive cases. Matt's group has been phenomenal, um, showing up, cleaning those spaces so they are ready for kids the very next day. So that Wednesday has been helpful as a buffer. But, but yes, those were good conversations. And another thing was the consistency of we've already set Wednesdays and keeping that the same rather than changing it. So, yeah, I mean, that was a good, good point. Cause I think that has merit. Any other questions or feedback for this evening for Dr. Wade or Eric? Okay. I appreciate that conversation. I appreciate the information tonight and the work that's gone into it. Yes, thank you for everybody for sticking sticking with us. And on that note, I look to Mr. Herman. And second from Brandy, all in favor? <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Motion carries 6-0 and we're adjourned. Thank you guys for a good meeting.